Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me hit the gavel and get the process started here. Uh, this meeting of the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety is hereby called to order. Um, we are going to be live streaming. Uh, we do have media here also. I think we're doing YouTube on UWM's channel. And I'm not sure if the Wisconsin Eye is here, but I think it'll be available sometime through Wisconsin Eye. So we'll have that, avail that availability also. Uh, I would ask uh, any of our, our visitors uh, that are here, please silence your phones uh, so that they're not going off and interrupting uh, testimony because uh, it does become a little bit, bit difficult. We do have a couple of uh, individuals that are on the phone uh, joining us because they have other commitments in the legislature and they're in Madison. Um, so uh, just a couple of housekeeping things while, let me just see here. Uh, nope, I'll wait for a minute. I'll put that in there. So uh, why don't we start off here and uh, will the committee clerk please call the roll. Senator Wongard. Here. Senator Wimberger. Here. Senator Jock. Here. Senator Darling is excused. Senator Bradley is Here. Senator Taylor. Here. Senator Royce. Here. All right. And I think Senator Jacques is on his way in, so uh, he'll transfer from the phone to. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Yeah, but I think you're 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 actually coming in, right? Uh, about 50 minutes though. Right. So you're going to be be joining us in 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 person. So with that, uh, the agenda today for our our hearing. First, I would like to thank UWM for allowing us to be here today. And I appreciate the committee members that were able to make it here today and everyone here that has come to testify. Today we'll hold a public hearing on Senate Bills 199, 117, 120, 121, 122, 123, and 124. If you wish to testify on any of the bills or register your support or opposition, please fill out a hearing slip and give it to our Senate page staff, which are located at the back of the room. Due to the room capacity, uh, we ask you, uh, if you do decide that you are testifying, uh, we ask you to testify and then to leave the room so that other people that are outside can take that position in the room to be able to queue up uh, to be able to give their testimony. Um, it's one of the COVID things that we're trying to work through here, so uh, we would appreciate if you would do that. Uh, just a reminder that our mics are on all the time. I might make that comment and remind people uh, that it is. Uh, if you're going to have a discussion about something, take it outside of the room also so that we don't interrupt the hearing. Um, each bill on our agenda today is authored or co-authored by Senator Lena Taylor and myself. Um, so Senator Taylor and I will be testifying together on the entirety of the agenda um, at one time. Um, Representative Branchen will also be coming up to testify as uh, an author uh, on several of the bills that uh, she authored or co-authored with us from the uh, assembly side. We will then open the hearing up for testimony. We do have time restraints today due to the availability of the room, so we ask that if you are here to testify on more than one bill, that you do so all at one time. Also, we are going to try to give everyone the opportunity to speak and may limit speakers' testimony based on the number of people that are here to testify. If there are people still waiting to testify at 2 p.m., we will record you as registered in favor or against whichever bills you register to speak on. And if you have written testimony, please provide a copy to the Senate page staff or you can email a copy of that into my office. Um, I think that pretty much covers all the housekeeping. Anything else? I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah, and also I have to remember to speak into my microphone. Did everybody hear me okay? Did you hear that? We all good? Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> um, gotcha. Okay, so uh, with that, I will be passing the gavel to uh, my vice chair. You got to speak into it. Oh, I have to really, oh, boy, you really do, don't you? Okay, see, we're in learning 101 here. Do I, do I need to go through this again? Maybe I should. No. I don't is, is everybody okay with what I? I, I think. I could think you pretty good. much hear it? I think. Okay. It's good. So, with that being said, I will pass the gavel 
to Senator Wimberger so that I may testify. Um, with Senator with Taylor, yes. Which, I with we're Senator Taylor. With we're not? Okay. What's the first one we're going to do? Oh, okay. <clears throat> You know what? We, we both can't. I'm just going to sit and sit. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll go back to my seat and sit. Well, no, I'll sit in Senator Jock's seat. <laughs> okay. There all right, Senators uh, Wangard and Taylor, um, I, I presume you're testifying on all of them at the same time just to, for expedition. Um, so uh, take it away. Yes, Mr. Chair. So thank you, committee members, for coming to Milwaukee today for today's hearing on police reform. I'm pleased to be joined by my co-author of these bills and lead author of one of them, uh, Senator Taylor. Although police reform has received a lot of attention over the last year, Senator Taylor and I have been working together to improve the relationship between the community and its police force for the last several years. The breakdown in trust between certain community members and the police did not occur overnight uh, and are not the result of a single incident. They occurred over time, sometimes the result of interactions between police and individuals, and sometimes the result of non-interaction. Some perceptions are based on reality, and some perceptions are based on myths. Some are mistruths hyped by people with an agenda, and sometimes they are the result of bad actors. People watch a video that shows a portion of an incident online or in the media, or hear a rumor and think they know exactly what happened, why it happened, and how it should have happened, even if they don't have any background information at all. It's important to remember and to say out loud that the overwhelming number of police officers in Wisconsin and the nation do an outstanding job. That doesn't mean there isn't room for improvement. Senator Taylor and I may not always agree on everything, and frankly, we frequently don't agree, but we both recognize that policing can be improved and agree on many steps to do just that. The key to rebuilding the trust, rebuilding the relationship, is to make sure there is a greater understanding of the ex expectations of those who serve to protect us and enforce our laws. This is accomplished by increasing the accountability and transparency of the police, and also increasing community involvement with the police. Accountability, community involvement, and transparency, that is the key. There are also the pillars of a legislative package of eight to 10 bills introduced by myself, Senator Taylor, Senator Darling, and Representative Branchen, and others known as the Public Safety Pact. We held the first hearing on three of the PAC bills last week in Madison, and those bills dealt with the review of use of force incidents, funding of police, and background checks. Today, we have several bills that increase accountability and transparency with police departments. I will discuss them briefly. Senate Bill 120, which requires every law enforcement agency to have a policy as to when and how a use of force incident is reported and requires officers who observe use of force incidents to report it. For officers who report use of force incidents, they will receive whistleblower protection. Senate Bill 121, which prohibits the authorization of chokeholds, is a use of force policy. It's important to note that chokeholds are not currently authorized in Wisconsin, and we have not been taught in Wisconsin for at least 50 years. Senate Bill 122, which requires use of force policies to be published online. Senate Bill 123, requiring the Wisconsin Department of Justice to publish an annual report on law enforcement use of force incidents. These bills are not controversial. They are either identical to or substantially similar to both Governor Evers and the Legislative Black Caucus proposal. To the degree that they are different from what Governor Evers proposed, I have discussed those changes with him and I believe he understands and accepts them. These bills are a good start and they make the police more transparent and help with accountability of police. But that does not begin to repair the relationship. It does not help to bridge the divide. 
To do that, we need more citizen and community involvement with the police. And I'll spend a couple of minutes on two bills designed to improve those areas. Police cannot be an occupying force in an area. That creates and adds an adversarial relationship between the police and the community members. Good policing means that the police and public safety is woven into the fabric of the community. To help build a relationship, Senate Bill 124 creates a grant program for community-oriented policing, or COP houses. This is a subject that Senator Taylor and I have been working on for many years. We've seen the success of the COP houses around the country. COP house programs focus on buying vacant homes in high crime areas and rehabbing the house to become a local point of contact with law enforcement, where officers perform daily duties while building relationships as a member of the neighborhood. And the fact is, community policing works, as seen in Racine, where I served for 30 years in law enforcement. Non-emergency calls to police decrease and property maintenance increases. People have pride in their community. Crime rates plummet, including by up to 70% in some neighborhoods. In one neighborhood, aggravated assaults dropped by 94% in just four years. Over time, the COP house becomes a part of the community where people feel safer, build the relationships with people in the house and each other. COP house becomes a public space for community issues and brings the police to a central place in the neighborhood discussions. Citizens can get the knowledge and resources to take their neighborhood back, leading to long-term stabilization of the neighborhoods. COP houses help build the relationships between communities and policing. But the community also needs to feel ownership over the police. In some cities, there have been calls for more quote, civilian oversight, unquote, of the police. What people don't realize is that we already have community oversight over the police. We were the first to do so. Milwaukee and Wisconsin led the nation in community oversight. We led the way. We were the national model. Unfortunately, rather than staying the national model, Milwaukee's community oversight organization, the Fire and Police Commission, has become a model of dysfunction, embarrassment, and infighting. And I could literally go on for hours about what has occurred in the Fire and Police Commission, but let me give just a few highlights. The commission is currently paying two police chiefs because they improperly fired Chief Morales and have been without a permanent chief since last August. The previous chair of the FPC is accused of asking for a quid pro quo in exchange for giving Chief Morales a contract. There have been multiple complaints for bullying, hostility, and racism within the commission. Multiple people have cited that decisions are being made because of ego, personal agendas, and political infighting. Another person stated that dysfunction has been baked into the FPC governance structure for far too long. With Milwaukee taxpayers paying millions of dollars in settlements for police, it's important that the FPC be vigilant about who the commission hires as officers. Commissions deduct, conduct background checks for a reason. Unfortunately, a former staff member publicly reported that commissioners, for the most part, have overturned background failures, unquote, including people facing serious charges and in litigation. According to this staff person, uh, quote, commissioners have been overturning backgrounds that have some very big red flags, candidates that should never have had their background failures overturned and never should have been hired. They are not making decisions based on who is the most qualified and what is best for the city. With this knowledge, it is any wonder why the city of Milwaukee leads the nation in police settlements. It has gotten so bad that even Mayor Tom Barrett is finally, after years of turning a blind eye to the corruption, is calling for reform. Although it's been three months, we haven't seen any ideas from the mayor. It's important to know that the Milwaukee Fire and Police Commission is a product of state law. Senate Bill 117 is that reform, and it is years in the making. SB 117 provides more accountability, more perspectives, and more independence for police and fire commissions in Milwaukee and Madison. According to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, 
when an alderman asked if the previous chair of the FPC had broken any commission rules about conflicts of interest or standards of conduct, the response from the city attorney was, quote, no, because the commission doesn't have any, unquote. To correct that grievous error, Senate Bill 117 specifies that the commissioners of the Police and Fire Commission must follow the state code of ethics and conduct uh, conflict of interest laws for local public officials. To increase the community input into the police, we require public hearings on commissioners and police chiefs. Those are community meetings, not necessarily legislative meetings. This will allow the public's voice to be heard. When asked, we also require chairs, vice chairs, or executive directors to, to, to participate in meetings of the Common Council. Fire and police commissioners were created to separate policing from politics. Policing should be consistent under the police chief, not based on the whims of an election. Unfortunately, the lines have become blurred between politics and commissioners. Uh, commissioners are intended to be independent and autonomous. In Milwaukee, the executive director of the Fire and Police Commission is a member of the mayor's cabinet. He or she can be appointed and fired solely by the mayor. This makes the FPC, the staff, and the director arms of the mayor's office. That is directly against the purpose of the FPC. SB 117 fixes this by creating a truly independent executive director. The director would be selected from a list of three names given by the commission. Once appointed, the director would answer to the commission itself, not the mayor. This creates a truly independent led citizen board. And finally, it is important that police and fire commissions actually know what they are overseeing. Again, according to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, a former commissioner who resigned in disgust at the end of 2020 stated that the FPC was, and I quote, the most dysfunctional group of individuals I've ever worked with, and the pitiful thing about it is none of them has any knowledge of how a police department even operates, unquote. This may not be the root of the problems on the FPC, but it is a major problem. You can't oversee what you don't understand. SB 117 requires that commissioners undergo training on the mission and role of the commission, disciplinary hearings, conduct policies, and use of force guidelines. To also add to the knowledge as to how a police or fire department operates, we require the presence of a former police officers and firefighters on the commission. These members would be selected by the mayor from a list from the police and fire associations. As a former police officer and police and fire commissioner myself, where I served two terms under two different mayors, I and my former PFC, co PFC colleagues can tell you that this perspective is invaluable to effective oversight. It also helps to demystify police tactics for commissioners and the public. We need to improve the relationship between the community and police accountability won't do it alone. Transparency helps, but it isn't the only answer. The community involvement alone can't do it either. But by increasing accountability, community involvement, and transparency, the A-C-T in PACT, we can make meaningful progress to bridge the gap. Those are my comments on the bills that we're chatting with today. And I now would ask my colleague and co-author, Senator Alina Taylor, for her comments. Senator? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. First things first, uh, I want to thank Senator Weingard for bringing the Judiciary Committee to Milwaukee so that people can have an opportunity to be able to come and to testify about these pieces of legislation. Many people cannot um, go all the way to Madison in order uh, to come to a public hearing. And uh, at a time when even our Joint Committee on Finance is not coming to Milwaukee, uh, even though it is a place that they normally uh, have come, historically, having the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee here uh, is an important thing.
Second, I want to thank Senator Weingart for being willing to create a footprint on places that we need to address change in policing. I'm not naive to believe that these are the answers. Actually, there's no one or two answers. But I do believe that today, the, le the bills that I'm on with the Senator and the bills that, the bill that I um, am leading, SB 199, are bills that begin a process that we need. Let me start with SB 199. It is a bill that says what many of you might think is already not legal, that law enforcement cannot have sexual contact with a person that is detained by them or that they, are, they have in custody. I learned of this bill because of a woman in New York. But when it hit home, even in the center part of Wisconsin, it made me realize that this was legislation that we should consider. And when you, can, when you see what is even happening right now in the Milwaukee County area, we presently even have a situation. I won't go into details of that bill or the others, but I will try to speak to the footprint that Senator Weingart and I helped to do with these pieces of legislation. One of the areas that we have found that has a, a great sense of angst, of challenge, is oversight. SB 117 for Fire and Police Commission puts in some parameters for training for commissioners, puts in parameters beyond the training for commissioners before they can vote on certain issues so that they are aware of the work that they do. It also, very candidly in Milwaukee, it requires that the positions that are available, that they have to be filled. And if not, it gives a mechanism for those positions to be filled. In particular, um, there are nine positions that could be filled with the Fire and Police Commission. And for more than the last decade, the uh, mayor of the city of Milwaukee has chosen not to fill those positions. Those positions are citizen oversight positions. And by someone um, being on that uh, commission, they are able to, you know, very candidly be involved in the process to hopefully make our community police relationships work better. I know that there are some areas that people will also speak to that they, that, of places of concern. I know that uh, individuals have spoke about the requirement that there be one police officer and one firefighter on the commission, especially because of the changes that uh, happened in, or the issues that happened in the past and thus the changes to get us where we are. But I want to be clear that presently we have a representative from the fire department and the police department. Well, he resigned, but the fire department on the commission. And what we have found is that their insight has been valuable. Mr. Cocroft's in particular insight has been extremely valuable. Um, I think the issue that some have is that the um, association gets to give a list of individuals. I respect that. And what I want to say to individuals that I'm not going to suggest to you that any of these bills have everything that even I agree with. But what I do know is that we have to have a commission that is um, used where appointments are made, we can't have individuals. Another piece in the bill is to require that individuals cannot sit on the commission and not get reappointed and just sit on the commission and do the work. 
So outside of the Fire and Police Commission and those changes, there are changes that allows the Common Council President, the Common Council to have a process uh, that can exist for them to be a part of the choosing of a chief, as well as the process for the community to be engaged in what happens so that there are not things like what we saw even with the fiasco with uh, the most recent process for the choosing of a chief. they could not even uh, get community public hearings the way that they needed. And very candidly, we've not, we don't even have the selection um, process of a chief the way that it should. So that is the Fire and Police Commission uh, bill. And there are other components of it, but those are the pieces that I believe are most important that began to give transparency and began to move the process in a way outside of the independence away from the mayor's cabinet. So thank you also for allowing us to hear uh, Bill SB 120. Last year, uh, I came across a report that was entitled The Evolution of the Modern Use of Force Policy and the Need for prof Professionalism in Policing. It was written by uh, Mr. Reiser and uh, Ms. Mooney. And the first paragraph of the report reads as follows. The American people delegate to the police the authority to enforce criminal laws and promote public safety. As part of that delegation, we give officers power to use force and even violence, that is, force applied to the body to accomplish those goals. This practice is familiar to us but it is in deep tension with our system of limited government that prizes personal autonomy and liberty. That tension can only be maintained by careful application of rules and procedures that restrain the use of force. And by instilling humility and care in the police themselves. Unfortunately, the existing issues that we have against excessive police use of force are far too weak. Lastly, the report said almost all large police departments and most small ones have use of force policies that define a continuum of force that can be applied to suspects in varying circumstances. While the report went on to discuss the pros and the cons of training, other efforts, and diversity in hiring, the authors deemed that the most attempts to get a handle on excessive force and the practices and the standards around it continue to come far short. The article did talk about the culture of police departments the militarization of police equipment, and even the way that police view, or view, even the way that the public is viewed by officers. This is an age-old conversation, and we've tried to address it, and right now we're trying. We require law enforcement agencies to have policies regulating the use of force by police. We don't have that. So these policies are required to be available to the public. Presently, we don't have that. However, often the policies seem vague and frequently lay people are left with more questions than answers about how and when these types of various forces, forces deployed. While George Floyd's case in Minnesota was not the first time I questioned use of force policies, it was a clarion moment when I questioned the role of other, of, of other officers in addressing issues and questions on how to handle the use of force concerns within their own departments. 
Since Mr. Floyd's death, we have learned that two of the officers had only been on the job for a few days. In response to questions about why they didn't stop the former officer that day from kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, it seemed as if these rookie officers were unsure if they could even speak. SB 20 is an attempt to further clarify those questions for members of law enforcement. This bill requires the use of force policies to be provided and incidents in which a use of force must be reported and how to report it and a requirement that officers who engage in and observe a reportable use of force must report it. Now this bill would not have saved George Floyd. It doesn't deal with real time inappropriate use of force and an officer's responsibility to stop. But what it does do is help support officers who wanna do the right thing. This bill protects law enforcement officers for reporting a violation of an agency's policy or standards regarding the use of force from discipline. It is another tool to encourage a culture or environment of transparency in policing. We want to enable members of law enforcement to make their departments and agencies and, and their profession better. SB 120 assists them to do just that. SB 121, this bill is challenging. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to, to appear on this and to speak to this because it prohibits the use of chokeholds by law enforcement officers in the use of force policies. It is not a blatant prohibition and I respect people who believe that it should be. It gives an exception in life-threatening situations or in self-defense. I'm still working on an amendment to say and. First of all, let me say I'm not naive. This bill is only as good as those charged with enforcement. After all, a number of the nation's largest police departments banned chokeholds dated back nearly 38 years ago, as my, um, my partner in, um, in these uh, pieces of legislation, uh, Senator Wangar stated, it, it's not even something that's being trained or something that has been allowed in Wisconsin. The Los Angeles, the police department banned uh, what they called bar arm chokeholds in 1982. The New York police department banned them in 1993, except in an officer's life is in danger. The Chicago Police Department banned chokeholds in 2012. Philadelphia and Houston have similar, similar policies as well. And in 2020 story, NPR revealed that over the past 20 years, there has been no shortage of people who have died after neck restraints were used in their arrest. So even though they have been banned, there have been issues. As a former public defender, I'm familiar with complaints about chokeholds and neck restraints. I know that a, I know that a chokehold, which restricts the airways when pressure is applied to the front of the neck, is only one form of a neck restraint. The NPR article described that other forms of neck restraints, a stranglehold and uh, restricting flow to the, uh, to the brain, blood to the brain and pressure to apply to the sides of the neck. You know, um, the video where we watched Eric Garner be killed, who died at the hands of a New York police officer in 2014. Uh, you know, you heard me tell you that New York banned him in 1993. 
So they had banned him for 21 years. When, offered, when Officer um, Pantaleo choked Eric Garner to death. In the same year of Eric Garner's death, a New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board studied chokeholds. It found hundreds of complaints a year alleging that New York police officers were still using the technique. In fact, the use was on the rise. In Minnesota, a report by NBC found that chokeholds or neck restraints had been used by police at least 237 times since 2015 and caused 44 people to become unconscious. I don't know the specific numbers of individuals that may have been placed in neck restraints by law enforcement in Wisconsin. I just know that we haven't allowed it, but I don't know that it hasn't been done. However, one George Floyd, one Eric Garner, that's one too many for me. So I'm not naive. I don't believe that Senate Bill 121 is a cure-all. But what it represents is what it says. It's that the state of Wisconsin definitely is stating, with an exception for life-threatening situation of self-defense, which I believe should say and and imminent, that chokeholds are not legal in this state. I believe that message matters. I believe that we should equip law enforcement with the necessary tools to keep themselves safe, but to know the parameters. I also believe that we have to review those tools and ensure that they are being used responsibly. We have a responsibility to ensure the safety of everyone. And I think SB 121 provides that. I wish I could say that when police go to arrest somebody that everybody cooperates and nobody tries to hurt them. But that's not true either. And they have to have tools to work with. SB 122. This bill is important to me because it literally is about the people having access to the policies regarding use of force, whatever they may be. We've established that Wisconsin state law requires that each law enforcement agency will have to have a policy regarding the use of force to make it available for the public to view it. Now, I know everybody don't have the internet and I know that we said it should go on the website, but that is, I think, um, uh, necessary pr progress. This bill is also about transparency, and it does five things to help us achieve that goal. It incorporates technology available today that makes it easier to have accessibility to the information. And so they can, you know, put it on their website, posting it, posting it in that way. The bill requires a hard deadline for changes to policy to be publicly posted. And they make the process to request a copy of the use of force policy easier by requiring law, law enforcement agencies to promptly post a means to request the policy. So people can know it, get it. And it requires a copy of the current policy to be provided at no cost. So people can't be discouraged and a timeline when they need to get it within three days. I believe that that's important so that we know what departments are doing and uh, what is required. I think it's important for people to know their parameters so that you know when they step out. Last but not least, SB 123. SB 123 um, is reporting of law enforcement use of force incidents. So one, we're saying there needs to be a policy. We're saying that people need to have access to the policy. But we are also saying that that needs to be reported out to DOJ, Department of Justice. 
and that data should be collected because the belief is, is that if we look at what we're doing, we can determine how we can always, because it's always room for improvement, how we can improve. You know, um, my father has a saying, and um, it is so true. And every time something go wrong, I think of the saying, and it, pro it has happened every time. Like, that's the reason why. He says, you can't expect what you don't inspect. This data collection allows us to inspect what we expect. 2020 represented a year of social, racial, and political unrest. Protesters attempted to draw attention to their, their belief that the systematic policies creates disparities and inequities in the treatment of communities of color. Advocates of police reform have called for transparency in data kept about arrests, use of force incidents, racial demographics, and more. Not surprisingly, a conscious, uh, um, not surprisingly, our conscious cannot um, a consensus, I'm sorry, not our conscious. Um, not surprisingly, our, a consensus cannot be reached <laughs> about what is or isn't happening because oftentimes the data isn't that simple. Uh, it makes me think of um, Chief Flynn. We often were disputing about what the data was actually saying, right? Yes, there is certainly... Um, you know, a lot of bias and um, things that will not necessarily be fully understood in the data. But I think it's hard to do anything without having actual data and information collected. It's hard to respond accurately to criticisms um, of the department or agencies if you have little information. So across the board, we should know if inequities exist in arrests, in incarceration or use of force, I, I'll tell you a, a quick thing, a department that I often uh, commend the chief for his, um, I don't know what to call it, but I'm gonna call it forward thinking. And um, we were asking him about his arrests on, uh, in particular with um, citations and, um, criminal cases for individuals in marijuana cases. And uh, we were asking him if there were any disparities in his numbers. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. And so he went and got the data. And when the data came back, he was like, uh, uh, we, I, it, he started stuttering a little bit because he was a little shocked that his data showed him that he had disparities. So it's important to collect the data so that we can see um, where we are and how to go forward. And the bill will require DOJ to collect the data on law enforcement use of force incidents in particular. Use of force is the topic that I believe uh, for me is one of the most important at this point so that we can look at it and we can see even if there are biases, we can have a clear picture about shootings and situations in which serious bodily harm has resulted in the course of these interactions. Wisconsin would join a number of other states who are pushing for better data. The data allows for a more accurate review of law enforcement practices and recommendations for improvements where needed. While some might argue about potential costs and time involved, there is no denying that there is a need for standardized information from across the state. We are able to spend dollars more effectively and possibly gain other valuable information. We may learn how often mental illness may be involved in the use of force issues. Bottom line, better data moves us towards better policing, better community relationships, and safer communities. In the end, I think the message that I hope that you will see in, a, in these bills is an effort to create a footprint to move us forward. 
They are not the perfect. And if I've learned nothing else in almost 20 years, it's only, it's only about 17 right now. But in almost two decades, if I've learned nothing else in Madison, I've learned that it's like sausage making. I, although I've not seen sausage be made, I have to tell you that the concept of knowing everything that go in it, just the ingredients, I'm like, I don't want to see it. Just give me my Tennessee Pride sausage and don't tell me. But making legislation, you can't let the perfect get in way of the good is what they always say. So these may not be perfect. And some people might not even think they're good, but I will say that I do believe that they're better. Oh, I'm sorry, any questions? From committee members and Senator, you might wanna join me in case committee members have questions. Also. Yeah, are there any questions uh, from the committee? Thank you, Senator. And of course, committee members can always get us later. I, like to hear from the, the audience who has uh, come up. Next, uh, Representative uh, Janelle Branchen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us at UW-Milwaukee. Like Senator Taylor, I too am an alumni, so it is a privilege to be here today. I'm here uh, basically as a co-author on Senate Bill 117, but I have to do say it's a privilege to be members with, uh, on many of these bills, supporting both Senator Taylor and Senator Wangard, who've done a lion's share work here in trying to find transparent solutions for our, for our police and fire members. Um, I have my testimony here, and I'm just going to go through the highlights. Uh, Senate Bill 117 is an appointment, has um, several changes to our Fire and Police Commission, which I think Senator Wangard went through. We need to make changes. This is not a situation which is equitable not only to our citizens, but to our police and fire members. And although this may not be perfect, this is, I believe, a third attempt at trying to find some sort of program that we can agree to. The bullet points are pretty self-explanatory. It goes through an appointment of an executive director, it would be called an independent monitor in Madison. Mm -hmm. It also requires uh, representatives from the mayor from a list of both police and fire. You know, I, I know there's a lot of people that aren't here today, but there's a reason that every police officer is on this wall behind me. There's a reason when they walk in a room, they look at everything differently that we as citizens do because they are the ones that are defending us. When they go home, when they work, when they go to the coffee shop, they are always thinking about how they can protect us because these are the ones behind me that run into danger. And giving them a voice on a police and fire commission is the most common sense thing I could think of. You know, Senator Wangard actually has sat on one of these commissions and his ability to explain to people how the process works when, when the police and the fire department show up, when your house is burning, when someone's been shot. They have a completely different view and giving them the ability to be one voice at the table is so reasonable. It's so common sense. Why wouldn't you want those who are doing the job, who are making the tough decisions, that are handling our family members to explain the process? One voice, one vote. Why wouldn't we want them to be there? I applaud both Lena, Ta excuse me, Senator Taylor and C Senator Wangard for providing this bill because it makes so much sense that it, as we're trying to bring our communities together, we need to talk. We need to understand both sides of the situation. 
Listen, when police and firefighters make a mistake, there's only two options. They were improperly trained or they made a bad call. And for us to move forward, we have to know exactly what, how they're being trained so that we can make that adjustment. And we also have to make sure that if they are making the poor decisions that we have this opportunity now to judge them fairly. This bill also asks for mandatory training for that exact reason, so that the members of the committee can understand that this is not in their everyday realm. In a first class city, three members of the panel, if it is a, a panel against a firefighter, a firefighter must be present. Again, common sense if it's against a, a, a police officer, again, that we have a police officer available with that insight and knowledge of how they go up on their daily jobs. Finally, there's clarification that the commission must follow state code of ethics. Again, how much more common sense can we be? We wanna to work together. Bill 117 and many others that are gonna be heard today are that ability to start and go forward as we can build in our communities a safe, transparent, and professional process for Milwaukee and the rest of the state. Thank you very much for your time today. Any questions for Representative Branchon? Any questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Jordan Primko and Lee Todd, uh, City of Milwaukee. Thank you. Welcome. Well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to Milwaukee. Glad to have you here. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wangard and fellow members of the Senate Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety for the opportunity to provide testimony on Senate Bills 117, 120, 121, 122, 123, and 124 on behalf of the City of Milwaukee. Uh, I want to briefly touch on uh, Senate Bills 120, 121, 122, 123, and 20, 124. Uh, the, City of Milwaukee, the City of Milwaukee is in support of all of these four bills. And I just want to briefly uh, thank the committee for working on these bills. Uh, and point out that for the vast majority of these bills, um, these are steps that the Milwaukee, uh, the City of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Police and Fire Commission have already taken to institute for the Milwaukee Police Department. And so we are certainly encouraged uh, to see the rest of the state uh, also have some of these changes happen. Uh, and I just do want to point out and thank the Milwaukee Police and Fire Commission uh, for taking these initiatives uh, already. Uh, now I'd like to turn my focus uh, to Senate Bill 117, uh, which proposes significant changes to the board of the Police and Fire Commission in the City of Milwaukee. While there are several aspects of this legislation that may be beneficial on the whole, this bill would dramatically remove local control, restrict public oversight over protective services, undermine the public trust, and give outsized influence and control over the Police and Fire Commission to protective services unions. The City of Milwaukee Police and Fire Commission plays an important role in the oversight and policy agenda of the Milwaukee Fire and Police Departments. The Commission runs recruitment and testing standards for positions in each department, independently investigates and monitors citizen complaints, and discipline employees for misconduct. The purpose of the Fire and Police Commission is to have a citizen-led oversight of our protective services department. This bill is a direct affront to that purpose. This bill would require that there be at least one former police officer and former firefighter handpicked by their respective unions appointed to the board. This bill would require that each protective, uni uh, protective services union provide a list of five names from which the mayor must appoint one for each union. This is a major removal of local control over the Fire and Police Commission. This bill provides no mechanism if the list of five names submitted by each union 
does not contain an acceptable nominee. In certain circumstances, this bill would allow the protective services unions to appoint members directly to the board without a nomination by the mayor, nor the consent of the common council. The mayor and the common council have not been opposed to having former firefighters and policemen on the commission. Previously, the mayor has committed to doing so, negating the need to have this in the legislation. There is currently a retired firefighter, Everett Cocroft, as a member of the commission. Limiting the city's options to a union-picked nominee, as this bill requires, is not a process that we can support. Additionally, this legislation would require that the hand-picked commissioners representing the prep, uh, protective services unions would be required to participate in every single disciplinary hearing for their respective branch. This would be a substantial and burdensome time commitment for those respective commissioners. Disciplinary hearings at the Fire and Police Commission can sometimes last several full days, and there can be upwards of 20 or more disciplinary trials in a single year. Requiring a single commissioner to, end, to attend every single disciplinary hearing could lead to over two straight months of disciplinary hearing work alone for that respective commissioner. In addition, this bill does not provide an alternative should the union appointed commissioner have a conflict of interest. For example, if the officer being disciplined were a family member or other relation. Instead, this bill would require that that commissioner oversee the disciplinary trial even with a clear conflict of interest. Disciplinary hearings are one of the most important roles of the Fire and Police Commission, and one of the reasons it is essential to have a citizen-led board of commissioners. This bill would instead place a union-picked commissioners and have them participate in every disciplinary hearing for one of their own union members. This would completely undermine the public trust of the disciplinary process, as well as damage community relations with protective services. While this bill does require a minimal amount of public hearings any time a new search for a protective, service, a protective services chief is initiated, it provides the protective services unions a closed session to meet with the board of commissioners to discuss a potential hire. This closed session, session would provide protective services union whose membership now primarily lives outside of the city of Milwaukee, a confidential and outsized voice in the hiring of any new chief. This provision would prioritize the influence of union members who live outside of the city of Milwaukee over the opinions of actual community members. It would undermine the hiring of any new chief and go against Wisconsin's long-standing history of open government. The city supports the parts of this legislation calling for additional public hearings throughout the process of hiring a new protective services chief. And we see no reason that the protective services unions cannot participate in those very same public hearings as the rest of the community. Finally, this legislation further serves to undermine the disciplinary authority of the Fire and Police Commission through judicial review. This bill would direct a circuit court to essentially dismiss and reverse disciplinary decisions of the Fire and Police Commission for a broad array of issues, whether they are material or not to the mis misconduct of the disciplined officer. It further authorizes the court to take additional testimony, dep depositions, interrogatories, and discovery. The essence of these changes is that it would completely delegitimize and undermine the authority of a citizen-led fire and police commission. This legislation would further cause a surge of additional legal fees for the city of Milwaukee due to the litigation costs the city would incur from all these judiciary, uh, judicial disciplinary appeals. The city of Milwaukee certainly has had a recent history of turmoil on the police and fire commission but we are very encouraged by the recent leadership and direction of Executive Director Lee Todd and the continued work that the Commission has accomplished on use of force policy updates and other policy issues. The Mayor and the Common Council recently appointed and confirmed a new commissioner and, will be, and the Mayor will soon be nominating additional commissioners in the near future. Against all this progress, this legislation would weaken local control over the board placed outsized power into the hands of the protective services unions over police and fire commission operations and discipline, cost the city significant additional litigation fees, 
and denigrate the public trust in the Fire and Police Commission as a citizen-led oversight board. For all of these reasons, the City of Milwaukee is opposed to Senate Bill 117. I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration of my comments today. Uh, Executive D Director Lee Todd and myself would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Lee, did you want to come up and, and then we'll let you guys maybe answer we questions kind of, together. We're, we're happy to trade the mic as necessary. Kind of tag team, okay, Lee, that, that'd like be to awesome. testify first or were you oh, uh, Lee will not be writing any additional testimony, oh, okay. but he is oh, available okay, for fine. any questions. Okay, yeah, apologies um, for the confusion. Committee members, questions? Yes, I do. Make sure you hold your Thank mic. Thank you so much. Um, the first question uh, that I have is, um, if the de novo process is what you mentioned, if the de novo process was not a full usurp of the Fire and Police Commission's um, decision, but allowed for a review by a court, and if there was something else sent back to the Fire and Police Commission, um, would you deem that an opportunity for at least some appeal process does not really exist in the way that um, I would argue that most people experience in a court process? Sure, no. uh, and I think, uh, and I know that, you know, we've spoken, Senator Taylor and I have spoken yes. with, with Senator Wangard's office. I know that there are going to be uh, further amendments, I imagine, to this, to this bill. Um, you know, I think I'd like to reserve comment on whether we support whatever the amendments may be. Uh, I think it is, as you referenced, Senator Taylor, important to note that it is really essential to have a citizen-led Fire and Police Commission in charge of these disciplinary decisions. And so if there is a mechanism where if a court were to find um, there was a procedure that was not appropriate or, or, or that the Fire and Police Commission maybe didn't do something in accordance uh, with the rules, um, that it would be referred back to the committee to correct that, like it would with an appellate decision down to a lower court. And so I would ask um, for a legitimate suggestion um, it, for some process that would be equivalent to that of what a court does. We believe that we've thought of some process that may um, work, and we will ultimately share that, but I'd be very open to a process that suggestion that you may have. Um, the, the second um, thing that you mentioned um, that I wanted to make sure that it was clear on, um, the concept of that the person would be handpicked by the um, police association. And so you believe having someone that meets the requirements that the Fire and Police Commission has, that are individuals that uh, may be members of the um, uh, of the association, but of course members of the force. Um, uh, not members of the force, retired from the force. Um, you believe that the mayor being able to choose is still them picking. Well, I mean, again, I, there's certainly a circumstance where of the five names that the Protective Services Union offered. Uh, one of them is completely acceptable, um, but that's you know, but but that may not be the case. Uh, uh, you know, certainly I would imagine from a, the union's perspective, and and I know that that they, they will testify as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to want to uh, put forward five names that are going to be most protective of their union membership that are currently serving, uh, and uh, you know, a kind of a, a metaphor of, or analogy I've I've used is that if. Uh, I were to offer you five overripe bananas and say pick one, that doesn't make any of them good. Um, again, there could certainly be a situation. On what you're making. It depends on what you're making. Uh, that's but, true. If know, I'm making but, banana bread, maybe that'll get, work I out. I get the point. Of what, <laughs> you know of what um, you're trying to say because you're making banana bread. Is yes. Like, <laughs> I'm really happy. Maybe then that's perfect. That, that's what you've given me. But um, I, I get the concept of what you're saying, and I. But but I think the larger issue is. The mayor has already put a retired police officer, as a matter of fact, in a pretty um, uh, scandalous kind of way, um, the appointment happened to the Fire and Police Commission. I mean, I, I find it frustrating from my perspective that the mayor had more than a decade to appoint nine people to the commission, has refused to do that, and then when we 
were asking previously to do a piece of legislation and include the city and, um, and kind of debating the issue of whether or not the expertise of someone who is an officer or someone who is a firefighter being on the Fire and Police Commission, if it brings value at all. And when we were having that discussion, I'm going to be very candid, I was completely and utterly against it about four or five years ago. And then the mayor appointed some people to the commission. And I actually had to call him to ask him some questions about, well, explain this to me from the perspective I found myself asking for their expertise. And ironically, we found that we loosely, I'll use the word, liked them being on the commission. That's not every, that, that may not be every person. I get that. I get that. I get that completely. But it changed Everett's uh, Cocroft and Mr. B Robokowski. Him. Um, actually made people think differently, you know, about it. I wasn't, I, I was here because I was born, but when the commission had actually many individuals who were evidently affiliated with the department at one point, and this is why it got, or, or their review process used to be different. So my, my question to that is what's the, ch the I, don't, I don't hear a challenge to there being someone that's police or fire. I hear the challenge that the list is the challenge that you're articulating. Uh, I think our primary challenge is yet yeah, the list. And then the mayor, I know, and as this bill has had different iterations through years, um, has, has had discussions with Senator Wangard and others uh, um, to place uh, retired firefighters and retired police. He has attempted to do so, um, and he does not oppose to having those voices uh, on um, the Fire and Police Commission. Uh, I think what's important is to maintain local control and that have that be at the mayor's discretion and uh, work with the Common Council on that. Uh, and again, as we've seen through, uh, through fact, the mayor has not been opposed to that. It has appointed retired police officers and currently has a retired firefighter on the board. Yes, yeah, so he, he had been opposed and then he was for it. And now I'm just trying to make sure he's still for it is what I'm trying to be clear on. And so I think I hear you saying that there is agreement with that, but not necessarily the process. Correct. Okay, um, that was stated. And, and you said local control, that we're not picking them from the state level. So it's still local control. I, I'm confused on the, the, um, the, the assault on local control. I'm well, I mean, I think what, what this does, I apologize for interrupting. I think what this no, does fine. is requ it's requiring that two of the nine positions um, be appointed in a certain way. Uh, and further, in, again, this iteration of the legislation is requiring that protective services unions who, uh, you know, since Act 10, uh, and, and since the lifting of the re residency requirement, largely have moved out of the city of Milwaukee. What we're saying is, here's a citizen over, here's a citizen-led oversight board, but we're going to give two out of nine spots preference to people that may not live in the city. Well, actually, it doesn't say that because the Fire and Police Commission rules require some residency component. And but the only, union membership, the union membership, it, which, which is making decisions on these five, five names. would still have to meet the requirement. I, I, they do have to meet the requirements. What, yeah. I'm, what I'm trying to get at is They'd that. They'd have to sift through those then that meet the residency requirement or whatever it is of the commission. The, 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 the bill doesn't change that. Well, but what, but, but what I'm trying to say is that the protective services unions, which will be putting forward those five names, again, those five people presumably would live in the city of Milwaukee. I have no doubt about that and meet every other condition. Um, but it's giving preference to those unions whose membership are no longer city, you know, for are one, no longer for all one members of, of the nine, city. For, I, I want to just put it in perspective. It's, it, it is true. It is not for nine positions. The commission is nine positions. Correct. The police would get one. Yes. That's a pretty powerful one if they can rule the board. The fire would get one. 
And, and so the last thing I was going to ask about was the disciplinary um, component. And um, this is an area that I, too, have some, some challenges with myself. Um, how do you feel about um, uh, being a part uh, for advisory concept? I guess I, could you clarify because a little? Because I believe that the expertise issue is still, I think, useful. Um, it's one of the reasons that we put in some of the training for the board members, not, not even suggesting that such an amendment will be able to happen, but asking where does, where do you, where, does that help your area of concern with the discipline, disciplinary hearings? Well, I certainly think because that... Because then it's one of three. Yes, yeah, and it's one of three, uh, uh, and I certainly think that that expertise uh, of a former firefighter or police officer um, it would have no doubt be beneficial to the other commissioners that don't have that direct day-to-day -day experience of being an officer. Um, I think it's a concern, and, and again, I mentioned this in the testimony, maybe, maybe uh, Director Ta can expand upon this further. I think it's a concern to demand that that member participate in every single disciplinary hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, you know, again, Director Todd could probably walk you through how the panel of three is chosen of the commissioner members, mm -hmm. but, but that would not only be burdensome and time consuming for that member, uh, there's also inevitably situations, a lot of time uh, in police departments, uh, there are family members, there are nephews, there are uh, nieces and children that also serve in the line of duty, uh, and there could certainly be um, con uh, conflicts of interest where if we're requiring that one police member to sit in in every disciplinary hearing, what happens if it's someone they walk the beat with for 20 years that's being disciplined? The, of, uh, all it, of, your, of all of your um, concerns, that's one that I hear and I appreciate you sharing uh, and that I've noted because of the backlog, it immediately made me think, uh, I actually, um, uh, executive director uh, on the process, the three selecting three process, I, I created the legislation. <laughs> so I understand that from years ago, thinking we were going to address the backlog of both citizen complaints and disciplinary uh, concepts, trying to make it where they could move through the process a little more uh, easily because before you needed more than three um, commissioners. So um, I hear you. I appreciate um, your feedback um, on the legislation. And I hear you about the appointment piece, the disciplinary um, component, and the override of the commission with the de novo process. I think some of the items that you, that you mentioned as concerns um, are things that we have been, uh, Senator Wangard and I have been working on trying to um, come up with a, um, uh, another, you know, uh, version of where we are, but I, I just want to say for the record, you know, the reason that this legislation is happening is because, with all due respect, the mismanagement, the failure to do the appointments that have needed to be done of people who are qualified and ready to go and work on the Fire and Police Commission to move us in the right direction. And, and, and not letting an executive director be a independent voice to move us in the right, in, in, in the right path. I, I've, I've, I've seen that. I have seen that in my time period as a legislator who have worked on legislation related to the Fire and Police Commission. And I've especially seen it over the last decade and find it frustrating that I have to go to Madison to say, that we need to have transparency, have public hearings. We need someone to be appointed. We gotta put a, a clause in because if the appointments don't get done, then the Common Council needs to do it. I shouldn't have to go to Madison, with all due respect, to change the law, to say how a fire and police commission works, but you gotta do that when you have an executive who believes that he doesn't have to follow the rules and that he doesn't have to create a fire and police commission that works for the people. And so that's how we got here. That's how we got here. And, that, and that's the part that I, and that's, that's part of the reason that I believe that um, we have many of the challenges that we have in our community policing because we have not allowed um, 
the things that would help us to move forward, whether it was the High Point North Carolina po um, program that I, that I learned about at uh, the Harvard School of Government and brought back, or whether it was cop houses and couldn't get cooperation from the administration to do those, or for that matter, whether it's the appointments on the Fire and Police Commission, it's just unreal. It's unreal the, 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 the amount of chaos that we have allowed our police department and our community police relationship to come to when it could be different. I will never forget when my son got stopped for running across the street to take a turkey to a neighbor. And to this day, I specifically said to the mayor, let's use this as a teachable moment to heal what has been happening as an unwanted rites of passage for black men and boys in this community forever. And he looked at me like I'm looking at you and said we would do that. And that didn't happen. That trauma that my son experienced, I didn't even realize as a black woman, as a mother, I saw it differently. The long-term effect that that has. And for the mayor to be able to apologize to an NBA player, but not to a little boy in his community, is a reflection of the dysfunction that exists in him and in his leadership, and thus in what is happening with the Fire and Police Commission. Now, Mr. Todd, everybody thought he had appointed your dad. <laughs> to the Fire Police Commission. And I, I, I wish you well in this process. Um, but I am concerned that we have uh, a Fire Police Commission that has shown itself to be in chaos. And so um, you can't do the work, sir. And, and forgive me for my, um, my soapbox moment here, but you can't do the work if you don't have the investigators funded, if you don't have all the different things done. And that is part of the, what, I'm, what I'm speaking to. It's talking out of two sides of one's neck, speaking in one way for a camera, but in the budget, do you have the money for investigators and all of the different things that you need in order to move this, this commission forward, in order to create the accountability that a commission should have? And so I'd be very interested in having a meeting with you to hear what progress has happened because this bill is to give you the independence to move community policing forward in this community in a way that we all want to see. I, I want you to do Gandhi's quote, create, be the change that we want to see in our community. And so. You know, I am open to your input. Um, I'm not open to um, this is an assault on blah, blah, blah. I'm not open to that. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not willing to hear even that because I feel that it is um, a ridiculous statement and insult because I have tried to deal with the person that you work for. And we have tried to work with him on what to do for the Fire and Police Commission to move it forward. So I don't want to, I don't want to play politics or, you know, play those messaging. I want what can happen. What is it, what specific changes are you asking for? If you're just coming to tell me and, and, and do that, I, I can let you know. It, I'm not listening. Well, again, and thank you, Senator Taylor, and, and I know we've had discussions um, before this hearing, and, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and with uh, the rest of the committee um, and, and to, to see uh, what we can do with, with uh, improving this bill from the city's perspective. That sounds great. Senator Wimberger. Oh, it,
Well, I, I look forward to it because I want you to know that we cannot continue to have settlements like this and not have a mechanism where we're trying to swim upstream to figure out what we can do different. And we cannot have an executive director whose hands are tied because we have an executive who does not give you the power to do what you need to. That, that's what this is about for me. This isn't, the, the, I wouldn't care who's in that position. I, I, I don't want my grandchildren, if I'm lucky enough that my son will come back to this place. I don't want my grandchildren to be paying for settlements and my great grandkids paying for settlements in this city going into the whatever because we don't look at what's happening and figure out what we can do different. So thank you. I'll get off my soapbox. Please. Go ahead. Can you walk to the mic? Thank yes. you. I wanted to address the component of the bill that, uh, that would remove uh, the direct hiring and uh, an authority over the executive director from the mayor's office to the uh, the board of the fire and police commissioners and i understand that the intention of doing so is to provide the executive director's office with a further level of independence um, and i think that's a a noteworthy goal but i i fear that it may have to a certain extent an uh, the opposite effect uh, under current law the executive director is the principal assistant and uh, uh, to the board and serves under and at their direction. And I feel that under the current state of the law, I am able to do that. I am able to work uh, collaboratively with members of the board. At the same time, uh, the executive director is appointed by the, mayor's, by the mayor and serves at his pleasure. And I think having the executive director be part of the mayor's cabinet is, uh, is an asset in this role. It allows me to work with closely with the mayor's office, with other department heads like budget, uh, DER, um, the city attorney's office, in doing the work that the commission needs to do, like testing, hiring, and recruiting, the investigations, mm -hmm. um, work on the Collins Settlement Agreement, and building the audit unit, unit with the FPC. Uh, so I think that's, that is uh, a virtue under current law. Also, I think that it's important to remember that uh, the citizen board is a part-time board. Uh, and they have, well, while it's part-time on paper, they do, they have a, a lot of obligations and a lot of requirements to hear disciplinary appeals, uh, citizen complaint trials, uh, to uh, review everything they need to review to, to be up to speed and educated and informed on all the issues, and then to attend com uh, board meetings and committee meetings. I think it would be difficult, uh, potentially, for, for part-time members of the board to have that further authority to, to manage the work of the executive director. And I, I also think, Im importantly, um, the current system where I am a member of the mayor's cabinet or whoever is in this position uh, ha has one other virtue, and, and that's this. Uh, part of the role of the executive director, a major role obviously is to be a manager and the administrator of uh, the FPC department and make sure things are, are functioning properly, uh, but also, uh, the executive director, I believe, should be more than just an, a manager or an administrator. Those are important and critical functions, but he or she should also be an advisor to the board. Uh, he, should, he or she should ad advise the board when they may be not following policies or the law or due process, or when they, uh, uh, and also advising them on policy and best practices. I, I think that under the current system, it, it does provide independence for the executive director to be able to be honest with the board and give them board members the, his or her honest opinion, even in when that opinion might not be popular in the eyes of the commissioners. And I think being uh, a good advisor means being able to tell hard truth to the members of the board and the fire of the fire and police commission. And I, I think the current system does allow for that. So I'd ask you to consider that uh, uh, in, in evaluating this bill. I'm happy to answer any further questions on that as well. On, on that, can I ask, and I know uh, Senator um, uh, Winberger, you wanted to ask a question, but on this, if I could just, um, if you're suggesting that um, 
I don't know why the the executive director would still not it, it, under the concept of working um, for the board uh, would not be able to be a part of the cabinet if a if an executive um, of the city allowed that. Um, but the challenge um, and the reason you know that I speak to the challenge is because what you quoted versus what the city attorney said were not quite the same and that and the dilemma for the executive directors have been who do they answer to the mayor or the board and it becomes challenging because the individuals who have been selected for lack of a better way to say it to deal with the hire the fire the discipline uh, the challenges of trying to uh, move us forward in community policing the way that we want or in policing the way that we need um, is the Fire and Police Commission. So I am challenged by um, the executive director not being able to, with the board, to chart the course. Um, that's how it's supposed to work. The citizen board is supposed to work. It, it, it has not worked in that way because the person is, where, where you're feeling like they won't be uh, up front with the board, it's happened the same way, for lack of a better way to say it, with the executive of the city. And as a result of that, we, we haven't necessarily moved some things that we needed to. Like, for example, we couldn't move cop houses when they had proven to be very successful. Um, so I hear you. I look forward to our conversation, and I'll give my colleagues an opportunity. we have been so kind to come Senator down. Wimberger. Thank you, Senator. Um, forgive my uh, kind of ignorance on, on the... How, how it all functions internally. Um, I'm, I'm an attorney, so I view it in a different um, kind of perspective with due process and what have you. I understand the concerns um, kind of be, to, be, to be multifaceted that on the one hand, you have a lot of politics going on in Milwaukee um, and that can dominate. Uh, you have uh, concerns from some people that if, uh, if the Commission members are picked by the union, then well, they're just going to back their own boys. Uh, and the whole idea of um, penetrating a blue wall, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, might might not actually happen. And that, so it's a, a valid possible concern. Uh, but then there's also concerns uh, with citizens that perhaps um, uh, the commission could be dominated by people who are totally anti-cop. So if there's not that presence um, with police officers uh, or fire department members that uh, might know the business to say, well, this is, this is just how it has to function because of X, Y, and Z, um, uh, then that, that sort of voice won't be there. So uh, understanding all that and knowing that uh, probably we're going to need to have some sort of police and fire presence on these things, um, uh, how, how would you propose then to get uh, uh, a representative from them on these on these commissions, um, uh, realizing that if the mayor does the direct appointment, uh, then you, you, there's the concern about the politics that Senator Taylor is talking about. Certainly, thank you, Senator Wimberger, for asking the question. Uh, you know, I, I think um, as as Senator Taylor and I had discussed, uh, you know, the mayor has had discussions. Uh, in the past has appointed former police and fire. Um, you know, what this bill isn't doing is saying, is requiring to have a retired police officer and a retired firefighter on the commission. It's saying you have to have a retired police officer and a retired firefighter, and the union will let you know who that person is. Uh, and I think there's certainly other ways of going around that if, if this committee and the legislature deems it essential to have uh, a police, a yeah, retired. So I'm asking, what would be your suggestion? Uh, I, you know, I think I, if you wanted to, I, I think that you can just require to have a retired officer of uh, both service branch on the committee if you so, so yeah, choose. Yeah, but I mean, the, the selection process is the question mark. The selection process, if if you require, I think, if you were to require that there is a retired officer from each service branch on each, and you can st still continue as is the current process to allow the mayor to choose that person and the common council to approve that person. And how, how, um, how do you belay the concern then of the, of the politics involved with um, uh, perhaps a, a particular Talk in your mic. 
talking to your mic. How do you how do you then belay that concern? I mean, if uh, of 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 that other that other dynamic going on within a a city that might um, uh, might go too far the other direction. Well, I guess I would belay that concern um, through the current makeup of the Fire and Police Commission. Uh, the mayor has made all of the appointments to that commission, and I don't believe that we have found a commission that is openly hostile to either service branch. Uh, we have put together a commission that has a current retired firefighter, has been appointed of a retired police officer, uh, and, and the mayor's priorities year after year have shown that he, has, he did not uh, defund the police in his most recent budget. We have serious and significant issues with shared revenue that come into the city that has required us to cut police um, because of the pension contributions that the city is required to make. Uh, and further, there is an open process of hearings uh, that, uh, that the proposed commissioner would have with the community, would have with the common council before they are appointed to the board. So I guess I would belay those political concerns by pointing at, at uh, the, the history of the board, is that that's not been the case, that we're, ho we're, we're promoting openly hostile people to uh, the police and fire service union, or to services to that board, uh, and that uh, for the, the mayor and the common council to continue to have the authority to appoint people to that board that they think are qualified and can help move both departments in a positive direction. Um, and I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with um, uh, the concerns that Senator Taylor is obviously more familiar with being in her district. Um, but, uh, but I do know that there's a, there's a due process issue if, if, it's, um, if there's bias in, in whatever. And I, I suppose you try to create a system that catches all of that. Um, and in any system, perhaps there still could manifest some uh, bias one way or the other, and then that would be brought up on a de novo uh, or uh, uh, through the circuit court. Um, but uh, anyway, those are just my concerns. I'd, I'd, I'm interested in hearing your um, suggestions on that process, but also uh, how that process failed um, and, um, and uh, whether there's alternatives. But I, I, do, I, do, I do think it's a valid concern about um, the unions picking, picking their own guys, uh, not because not because it is going to be bad, just for, you know, even the, it, it can raise that suspicion. So I, I understand what you're saying. Thank you, Senator. So addressing just a couple of those things quickly here. Uh, first of all, um, the appointment of a member that is uh, put forward as a potential candidate for the commission by either one of the associations, you guys must really think that person is going to be so powerful that they're going to control the other eight members of the board. I went through the same thing when I was appointed to the Police and Fire Commission in Racine, the first police officer ever appointed, and four members of the council came to of the commission came to the council to ask the council to not put me on it because I was going to quote unquote take care of my buddies. I actually went through confirmation twice in two weeks uh, for that same thing with the council, but I was put on the board, and after our first hearing, the chairwoman baked me brownies and said, this is the best thing that ever happened. We have somebody that understands the process. So I don't get it where you think that one person is gonna take and brainwash the other eight people that are in there. And don't you think that that officer or that firefighter, because this is gonna be more transparent, is not gonna be under a microscope? Absolutely, they are more than any one of the other police and fire commissioners that are there. So they're gonna be bound to doing what is correct and right. The other issue is that the mayor still makes the appointment. They have a, a, a list of individuals that meet the criteria of having the experience, the street experience, and the knowledge to represent the career, not the individuals. They're not going in to just cover for their buddies. It doesn't work that way. And, and the other part of it is, you know, I know they don't, they have a lack of ethics on the board now that they're following anything, but I know our ethics codes, and they tried to have me recuse myself from the first hearing we had because I did some training with the officer that was up for a hearing, and I, I did not recuse myself because it did not fit any of the criteria for recusing yourself as a judge 
or as a county board member, which I was at that time, or as a legislator, which came later. The ethics part of it is if you live with them or they're related or you've had, had experiences in um, financial dealings, those are reasons of conflict to remove yourself from the situation. So I think that this is all a whole bunch of hyperbole to just muddy this up. It is so important to have somebody there that understands what the process is. And, and I would also say that understands how the association works and what the parameters are for the officers working in that association. Uh, and that that information can be brought forward in uh, a, a hearing. Now in my case, I was an expert in both federal court and in circuit court in police uh, operations as an accident reconstructionist. I taught for 45 years in the, in the uh, technical college system in the police academy. So if I didn't ask specific questions during those hearings and went back into the, uh, the ante room where we made our decisions, couldn't talk about things that we didn't talk about during the hearing. So it was really important that those questions were brought out and answered clearly in an open dis discussion. And it made sure that all of the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. This is what we were looking for. And, and lastly, I'd just like to point out that the city of Milwaukee or any municipality uh, has local control, but it's given to you by 6250 under class ones, and 6213 are the guiding state statutes that guide that. And the purpose of having somebody that is coordinating uh, the commission, like through the, the executive or the monitor position, is to have a complete separation and disconnect from the mayor's office or the controlling executive so that you have that autonomy for that organization so the people feel confident that it's not going to be a political football. This is why police and fire commissions were actually formed in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, in the original state when it, it first started was so that we could eliminate those things. And there's also a requirement that you have only so many Republicans and only so many Democrats is also part of the current legislation. So, you know, so it was the politics of the issue. And this is what the citizens want to see. They want to see a clear policy where there's no connection. There's, there isn't a person that is, and I have no problem. All the things you said are correct with giving advice and bringing them forward. But it gets tainted when it's connected to the mayor's office. Because now you've got the mayor controlling a board that he doesn't have control over by law. When he makes an appointment and he chooses that individual and they go on the board, they don't owe the mayor anything. They better follow the guidelines that they're trained to do for those mm -hmm. things that is their responsibility. Not being guided from the back door by the mayor. And this is where problems have occurred with our, the current FPC that there's been so much dysfunction without having that openness. So that's what this is we're working on. You did bring some, some good questions up with the conflict issue, and, that, and we're working on that. Yeah. And there are a couple other things that I really want to work with you guys on so we can have that dis discussion. And, and I'm open if there's something else that we can do to improve the bill. I think we're always open as the authors to do that. But I think we need to address the openness that our community deserves. And I think that's the clear point we're trying to make as legislators that's when awesome. we do this. So, um, and I just want to add, Mr. Chair, and uh, for Senator, and, I, I, and I'm not beating you guys off. Oh no, no, no! I, I, I just appreciate kind of letting you know why and what the function is here. And mm -hmm. so we're focusing on why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. We're not doing this to beat anybody up. We're doing this to really create a situation that that not only the the community feels safe and confident of, the, of their department, but these men and women that go to work every day to serve and protect, and that sounds kind of corny maybe, but I know that I kissed my wife and my kids goodbye every night when I went to work because I didn't know if I was coming home. And that is still the situation today with all of the craziness going on, the drugs involved and domestic violence and shooting. All this stuff is causing an issue. Low staffing, you know, budget cuts. These are things that are affecting what these guys in uniform have to deal with. So that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to create a balance so that there's a clear line and so that we can be supportive of these men and women, 99.9% .9 that go do their, their job every day as a career and don't think of people as numbers or not being important. I, I think our guys, for the most part, do a pretty good job. Once in a while, they're a little weak on being right because they're human. And then we gotta have the policy and procedures in place to, to, to deal with that. So that's what we're trying to do. 
And I, I just want to um, add that, as I stated, I'm open. You know, I, I um, want to hear your concerns. I do um, feel you on the, um, and, Dale, and you're I up think next. that's how we got to the five number, <laughs> um, is trying to have those conversations of whether or not uh, they should uh, select. They were never on the commission before. That's the whole Oh, yeah, that's right. When we started, I forgot to <laughs> mention that. When we first that. started this bill years when ago. When we started this bill, that's when, after we had a chat with the mayor, he thought, eh, I better do something with this, and then he appointed two individuals. So it, it wasn't necessarily individuals that were um, receptive to the, either one of the associations. He just kind of put them on there because of what they had done before. So I, I think that that actually did already generate some possible good stuff going on. But the board is still dysfunctional, so that's why this has to be addressed. So I just wanted to lay that out that the, previously there was, you know, no one from uh, fire or police that had been on the commission, and the mayor did that. So I'm definitely open to whether or not the association has to uh, be the entity that. Um, is a discussion that you know we've had the entire time because I can see the um, potential uh, conflict of how it looks uh, for individuals. But in the end, I believe that it's proven that the expertise is valuable. We even had conversation of whether or not someone being advisory years ago. We had that conversation. So I got uh, brownies for seven years. I got brownies for seven years every meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen, Thank for your Thank testimony. you. I appreciate the time, and I look forward to working with the committee in your offices. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'll be right back. Sheriff, Sheriff Smith, we're going to kind of flip you guys because he's got to drive ahead of him. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Wangard. And uh, all the rest of you for hearing me today. I'm Sheriff Dale Schmidt. I'm the Dodge County Sheriff. I'm, I'm also representing uh, the Badger State Sheriff's Association as the Vice President and uh, a member of the Wisconsin Sheriff's and Deputy Sheriff's Association. Um, thank you for moving me up. I, I have to get back to uh, Dodge County uh, uh, relatively quickly. I have some citizens and some excellent employees that I need to recognize here at 1 o'clock. So I, I do need to uh, get out of here shortly after this. But I um, wanted to take some time to to uh, reference SB 120, 121, 122, and 123. Um, both of our organizations are, are uh, supporting these bills, not just because um, they, they uh, are, are good bills, but they make sense, or because we're already doing them. This just codifies them. Um, and I wanna touch on that first. A lot of times new bills get implemented and uh, the news gets it, and, and uh, they're, they're, we, they're, the bill is passed, and oh, this is a brand new bill, and we've never done this before. Some of these bills that we have here, we are already doing, and there is no change in what we are doing in Wisconsin because Wisconsin is blessed. Wisconsin is blessed with law enforcement officers who are trained at a very high level, higher than the vast majority of law enforcement officers ac across this country. And I would put our law enforcement officers up against the vast majority of those law enforcement officers across our country any day of the week because of the training that we have, the Training and Standards Bureau that we have. And, and uh, we, we have very, very high standards. I'm going to touch on some of these bills. I'm not going to go into the bills because you already know what's in them. Um, but I will start with um, our policies. It's SB 120. It's been said that uh, we don't have any requirements uh, for our use of force policy. That's not true. Wisconsin Training and Standards, and in fact, state statute already requires that Wisconsin law enforcement agencies must have a use of force policy. It's already there. It's already a requirement. We already do it. It's one of, I believe, there's seven mandatory policies. I got a lot more than that, but I believe it's seven or nine. It may be nine uh, mandatory policies. This is one of them. We already have to have it. Um, this just expands it to make sure that it's readily available. It is already readily available. You come to any of our offices and say, I want the use of force policy, we have to give it to you. Have to. This expands it a bit, gives, puts it onto the website, um, and, and uh, makes it available to, uh, to those individuals. Um, I'm sorry, that was SB uh, 122. SB 120, the whistleblower po uh, protections. 
We in law enforcement call this officer override. It's a policy that already exists in many of our policies, or a procedure, I should say. It's not really codified in the state statute, but it is what we as administrators expect of our law enforcement officers is if there is another law enforcement officer who's doing something that is inappropriate, we need to step in. I can tell you that's not always easy. I'll give you an example. An example, me as the sheriff shows up at, at the scene of an incident in which a longer tenured law enforcement officer is there, is ramped up in something, and I have to step in and say, whoa, we're going to stop. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something a little bit differently because their emotions, just like anybody else's emotions, start ramping up. I did that. It wasn't a comfortable situation for me, even as the sheriff, but it was something I had to do, and it was the right thing to do. And it's what we expect of our law enforcement officers every single day. Does it happen every day? I'll be the first to admit that it does not. Why? Part of that is culture. Senator Taylor, who walked out, mentioned culture before. Culture is something that we do need to change, something, something that I have been working very hard at changing within my agency, and we've been doing a really, really good job, in my opinion, over the last six years of doing that. And that's something we need to do across our state. We still need to set that mindset. And this, is, this whistleblower uh, 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 bill is a good way to do that. It's a good start. I have training within my law enforcement agency on officer override or whistleblower. I prefer officer override. It really talks about what it is that we're doing. Um, but the whistleblower uh, protections allows that law enforcement officer to say something without that fear of retaliation, which shouldn't occur anyway. Um, I, we support this bill. We think this is a good step, a good step in the right direction, and it should be what we're doing already. It really should. Um, Senate Bill 123, um, publishing an annual report on use of force in incidents. Department of Justice is already doing that. They started it in 2020. This codifies it. We don't have a statute that codifies it. We started doing that this last year. It's a great tool for us to have. Do we have data out of it yet? No, because it's new, but it has begun. So again, I don't want anybody to think that this is something that's brand new that, that uh, hasn't been thought about before. It's not. It's codifying something that law enforcement has already, on its own, begun that process of doing. We look forward to seeing what those data points are. We look forward to seeing how that data shakes out, uh, but it has started. Prohibiting the use of chokeholds, Senate Bill 121. Again, Wisconsin, we don't do this. We have already heard testimony to that fact. We don't do this. We don't train chokeholds. Um, we, we did have a, a comment made that uh, we don't know what we don't know, which is true. We don't know that, it, that, it, that it's not happening. But we also don't know that it is happening here. Could it be? Could there be some officers out there that are? I, won't, I, won't, I, I, I can't say that. And it might be, but it's not something we train. It's not something we tell our people that they should be doing. And we already restrict this in our policies. We support this bill, except in those circumstances where deadly force is authorized or defending, your, defending yourself. I, asked, I, I was asked yesterday about this bill, well, Sheriff, what... what uh, what about, what about to those uh, people out there in the public that say law enforcement shouldn't be using force on people? Well, you as a citizen, I ask you, put yourself in that position. As a citizen, you are in a position where you have no other way to defend yourself, and you will die unless you use a chokehold technique. Would you use that as a citizen? I think anybody who is fighting for their own life would most likely utilize that if it was the only technique they had available to them. We as law enforcement officers are citizens as well. And so in those deadly force situations, I appreciate the fact that you are maintaining that legality 
in this statute. It's the appropriate way to handle this. It's the appropriate way to put, the, put in this bill. And, I, and, and we as, as sheriffs, I'm sure the chiefs um, agree, um, the, the law enforcement officers that are out there, we all have a very difficult job to do. We are put in very difficult position, positions each and every day. Senator Wangard, I kiss my, my wife and children every day the same as, as you did. And I'm not out on the street every day. But I run that risk just like every single one of my deputies that I might not go home to them at the end of the day. We also want to make sure that there are protections for the public. And we understand that. We want to be transparent. We want to work with them. We want to make sure that we are doing things appropriately. And if law enforcement officers are doing things inappropriately, if they're breaking the law, if they are stepping outside of policy, they're stepping outside of procedure, I will tell you as a sheriff, I will be the first one in line to hold them accountable for that. And I would ask that you support all of these bills. Um, uh, thank you for your time, and I'm certainly open to any comments and questions you might have. Questions? I would just like to thank you, Dale, for coming down and, and giving us coming down and giving us that that insight and I think it's important to understand this is just not about a metropolitan area this is about rural law enforcement too the all the officers whether they're wearing a black shirt a, a blue shirt or a brown shirt it's the same career that you're you're going out there to do so we need the accountability so that we don't have those kinds of issues and thank you so much for for coming down to participate with us my pleasure thank you for having me much appreciated Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, uh, Dale Borman from the Milwaukee Police Association. Can I take this mask off? Yep, when you're talking, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Senators. Um, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you. Um, thank you for coming to Milwaukee and listening to those who are either supporting or those who are, have concerns on the Senate bills that are before us. Um, while everybody here may or may not have completely agreed on the bills, I think it's very important that you hear those who have something to say about each one of them. Uh, my name is Dale Borman. I'm the president of the Milwaukee Police Association. I've been in law enforcement, all with Milwaukee, just short of 25 years. Um, and I was also I was a police officer and also a detective before becoming the president of the Milwaukee Police Associations. The MPA does support all the bills that are presented today, but I'd like to take a couple minutes to speak about some of the bills. Um, some of the shorter bills, uh, Senate Bill 120, um, is very important to us. Uh, like many other jurisdictions, our department does have a use of force SOP in place. Um, but I think it's very important to have the bill in Wisconsin that requires how uses of forces are reported. And it protects those who see a use of force that occurs and, re and reports it immediately. Um, just Monday, I spoke to a younger officer on the department who has about two years on the job. And along with it, along with talking to this officer was internal affairs sergeant and the internal affairs sergeant said to the officer that um, if the officer sees some type of incident or use of force that goes on, they have to speak up. They have to stand up and report it. And the officer was kind of, had a dumbfounded look on his, on his face. And 25 years ago, when I first came on, um, it really wasn't understood to stand up to other officers. And, and I think the whistleblower uh, bill that's on the table here is a very important bill because it gets these younger officers and older officers, but it get, mainly gets the younger officers to speak um, and stand up for citizens and for those who are we come in contact with every day. So I think that's a very important bill um, and it does protect our officers who decide to stand up and who should stand up and report these incidents. Senate Bill 122 um, requires the department to post the policies regarding the uses of forces. Um, we support this one also, along with Senate Bill 123. Senator Taylor's not here, but we, the Milwaukee Police Association supports Senate Bill 124. 
uh, community or oriented policing house programs. Uh, has worked in other cities, including Racine. Uh, it's a very important piece in law enforcement that will help with communication and with working together with the community. So we strongly support the COPS program, the COPS housing program. And Senator Taylor, if we would look forward to working with you on that Senate Bill 124. Thank you. Um, and then Senate Bill 199. Um, my notes, my notes, uh, you guys are going to kind of laugh, but it's needed. Um, to, to even have to put it down on paper is disgusting. It, it's gross. Um, a person who does this, who has contact, sexual contact or sexual, um, sexually assault somebody that we've had contact with or arrested, uh, not only damages that person, which it should, um, but it also puts black marks on the officers that wear the badge and who doesn't do that. So we are in support of that one too. The last two um, bills that I want to speak about are Senate 121 and also Senate Bill 117. I'm going to start with this, uh, Senate Bill 121, which deals with chokeholds. Um, I'm puzzled with ch chokeholds. Um, in 25 years, I've never, ever used a chokehold on anybody. I, I would probably go as far as to say uh, in my 40 plus years on this earth, I've never used a chokehold on anybody. Um, but I've also never been in, in a fight for my own life. Um, I've been lucky, you know, so far. Um, only, and I repeat, only, in a life-threatening situation or in a self-defense situation, an officer should be able to use chokeholds if they need to, to defend themselves. I'm not saying that every officer should be using chokeholds. As a matter of fact, I would actually say the opposite. An officer should not be using chokeholds. But if the person is in a life situation, a life saving situation, or they think their life is going to be um, come to an end, that person is going to have to use whatever it takes to keep themselves alive. Um, that's the basics of saving your own life. That goes for any citizen out there. It goes for you guys. It goes for the governor. It goes for police officers. Um, anyone would take, would, would do whatever it takes to save their own life. And I think this line that's in the bill um, regarding life-threatening situations or self-defense situations is very important. And I think it needs to stay in the bill. Um, by the way, chokeholds are, are never taught. They were never taught in the academy. Um, I've never learned a chokehold, which is probably why I would, I would never use a chokehold unless absolutely last resort. I don't know if I would ever, I don't know how I would handle a chokehold. Um, it, it's, um, it's a situation that I just have a lot of questions on. Um, but recently we've had an important um, incident where a chokehold was used. Um, this incident happened off duty and it has nothing to do with an officer that was on duty. Um, and I'm very sorry for that incident. Um, that incident probably should never have occurred. Um, but I was not in that situation. I don't know what took place and truly I don't want to know. Um, it, it, as bad as that sounds, um, that is his business and he's going to have to deal with that part of it. Um, the last one I want to talk about is Senate Bill 117 that deals with the Milwaukee Fire and Police Commission. And I call it the Milwaukee Fire and Police Commission because our FPC is in a disarray. Um, in my 25 years, I've never seen it this bad with our FPC. Um, our, fire and, uh, our FPC not only um, hurts our citizens of Milwaukee, it hurts the officers, it hurts the fire department, it hurts a lot of people. Um, Senate Bill 117 
starts correcting the issues and the disarray that's going on with the FPC. Um, this bill requires that members of the FPC attend training. If you ask any one of the current commissioners if they've ever received any training on law enforcement or firefighter um, experience, they probably have never done that. Um, our, those sitting on the commission should receive this training. It's been offered to them, and they still stand and, and decide not to receive the training. Uh, the only person that probably has received the training is uh, Commissioner Colcroft just because he went, he retired from the fire department. And I give him kudos for that. Um, we talked about uh, the fact that um, having an officer and uh, a retired officer and a retired firefighter on the job, um, from the job to going on to the FPC, it does add a valuable experience to the whole process. Um, since our commissioners have never received, went through any type of training for this, with the exception of Commissioner Colcroft. C Commissioner Colcroft can give him, give the other commissioners the valuable insight of how to do uh, the job as a firefighter. And have any retired police officer on the commission would do the exact same thing for those who didn't receive the training. We are just asking for that. How that's done, it's not up to me. That's up to you guys how you guys decide or how you want that makeup decide on the commission. But I do believe the commissioners should go through some type of training. There is a Citizens Academy that our department has, puts on every year. We ask them to go through the Citizens Academy, both for police and firefighter. They should learn that stuff. They should learn exactly what it takes to be a police officer and a firefighter so they can bring that experience into what their decisions are um, and as their role as commissioners. The FPC recently hired an executive director. I think he started the 1st of January. So he's three months into his position. The current executive director has replaced a troubled one. And at first she wasn't. Something flipped and it became troubled with her being into that, in that position. I certainly hope that the executive director, the current one, can help the commission to be the best in the country. We owe that to our citizens, and we owe that to our police and fire fighters. It's very important that they support our officers and our law enforcement, along with supporting the citizens of Milwaukee. Um, Unfortunately, because it's only been three months, it's still too early to determine if uh, this current executive director is gonna be the best executive director out there. The commission, the FPC does have up to seven positions filled. Well, six now. Uh, one of the commissioners uh, resigned his position, so we're at six. Um, each of these six commissioners has been selected by the mayor and confirmed by the Common Council. I think that's important. Um, and I think it, it. I think it's important to um, have nine members on the commission, um, as the bill states, um, because I think it it takes the pressure off the seven members, and the additional two members can assist them in deciding and um, deciding what's best for the law enforcement and the firefighters. Um, the FPC does a lot of things. Uh, you heard previously uh, exactly what they do. There are on a lot of commissions, or uh, subcommittees and things like that. Um, but I think the community needs to see the commission increase to nine. It brings diversity and, and it definitely helps um, that commission out. Um, again, I, I will repeat this probably till the day I'm unfortunately dead, but I do believe the commission should have one firefighter who is retired and one law enforcement officer that is retired too. Um, it gives the opportunity to offer their experience to those who are not, were never in law enforcement or firefighting. Um, and again, it's only, it only merely offers insight into what they did as um, when they were on the job 
and it helps out the it helps out the other FPC commissioners decide what to do. Um, at the end of the term, for a commissioner, he or she should not continue unless appointed by the mayor and reconfirmed by the common council. We've had at least one, if not a couple, commissioners who whose term ended and they've stayed on the commission for several years At without least. being reconfirmed. I, I think that's troubling that that even can exist. Um, I think a person who should remain on the commission can be reconfirmed by the Common Council. Um, that shows confidence in that commissioner and it also gives the commissioner confidence that somebody believes in them to do the right thing for this job. Um, finally, currently the chief of police recommends discipline for each of our law enforcement. I can't talk about the firefighters because I don't know, but for law enforcement, the chief of police recommends discipline for us. If it is six days or more that they get suspended for, it can be appealed before the FPC for a hearing. And recently, at least this year, we've tied up the FPC. And I'll be the first to admit that. Um, our officers have the right to appeal. That's their due process. And they choose to appeal. So unfortunately, we have tied up the FPC um, you know, to a point. But it, it, it's interesting because our Fire and Police Commission has overruled um, all the cases with the exception of one and they you know the officers they've either come back to the job after being terminated or they've had discipline of 60 days or however many days that originally was given to them decreased um, so I can't at least on that part I can't really say anything bad about the FPC because obviously when an officer comes back that that definitely or has discipline uh, reduced that definitely helps us out too um, but if the FPC decides whether to sustain the proposed discipline or or if sustained applies the appropriate penalty to after the hearing um, and that's where I said that they have had either been fired and came back or they've actually been disciplined for le a little less time than what originally given um, if the FPC sustains this charge the officer is discharged and that officer may appeal to circuit court. Um, but this bill will allow circuit court to review the evidence independently and without deference to the board's findings. And in other words, that's the de novo part that we're asking for. Um, one of the issues that we are having with that is um, if an officer is fired and it is uh, sustained by the FPC because the FPC has not gone through any of the training and stuff like that how do we know if they fired him in for whatever reason so we do have some issues with that uh, this bill will also allow the circuit court to take on additional evidence so in the meantime when we have a, a lawyer working on the case and they come up with additional evidence the bill as it is written or proposed would allow the circuit court to look at that additional evidence and determine if uh, that evidence should be used against the officer or used in favor of the officer. It's important to have circuit court review uh, additional evidence and to rule on the case. Um, with that, I'm done speaking on any of the bills. I am open for any questions that you may have and we'll kind of go from there. Questions, commissioners? Commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, <laughs> committee members? No, I, I just want to thank you um, for your testimony and uh, for your openness. You heard the um, testimony from the city and from the Fire and Police Commission and the challenges uh, that I would also say that I know that people of the community have had is with you being able to, meaning the union, not yourself personally, being able to um, select five. And yeah, then the yeah. other piece is to be a part of um, the disciplinary uh, process. 
uh, and to be able to be in a private meeting when the Fire and Police Commission has made its selection of who they're going to choose. Not necessarily, I think, the way it was presented of a private meeting to discuss or, you know, like okay. for you to choose for them, not that. So um, you've heard those concerns. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I forget that the mics don't work that well. So you've heard the concerns that uh, have um, been presented. So in the midst of um, trying to work through what, what might be able to happen, um, is there a reason um, that you believe that as long as there is a law enforcement person and a fire person and not necessarily from those selected uh, by the association, um, do you believe that as long as it's someone who has been a part uh, of the force, uh, a part of um, the, the brotherhood, um, that they, would, they could be sufficient? Uh, without them being someone that you've, for lack of a better say, it, teed up? I caution you with that. Um, we had a, a police or a law enforcement retiree on, and he left for unknown reasons. Um, he wouldn't say exactly why, he, you know, with the exception of he's saying, you know, the commission is in a disarray. Um, I caution, again, I caution you of, uh, just taking whoever the mayor nominates and is confirmed by the Common Council. I think one of the issues you can potentially have is if you have a mayor that just absolutely does not like the police department for some reason, and I'm not saying that's happening now, I'm, not, I'm just saying if he happens to have it, he could potentially find the wrong person, the wrong police, retired police officer, who also hates the police department for whatever reason and put them on the commission. And I think, I think that's dangerous of finding, just finding somebody who retired and, and you know, asking the common council to confirm them and putting them on, on the FPC. Um, I think one, and it was said multiple times, I think one person does not overrun a commission of nine. And I think that's hard. I think the person that should go on the commission should be somebody who's knowledgeable in everything that an officer does, whether it's use of force, that techniques, things like that. They should be very knowledgeable in that. And there are some people out there that, quite frankly, really don't know. And I would think the citizens of Milwaukee would want somebody on that commission who, who knows those things. In, and I'm not asking to be the sole decider of how they pick and, you know, how many people and things like that. But I think it's very important that a union looks at it, looks at the list, and gives either gives suggestions of who could possibly be the person that should be on there or who shouldn't. Um, I think it's a long, long-winded answer, and I apologize. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate um, hearing your input on that. I just, you know, believe that there are legitimate, um, legitimate concerns in uh, not only the, um, the appearance, mm -hmm. um, but the scenario that you um, mentioned. I just am not fully clear on any mayor that would not want to support those that are to protect and to serve their their citizens, uh, especially one where their <laughs> tax levy is more, mm -hmm. uh, less, I mean, than what they're spending out, right, uh, to a force. And and so I, I, I just wanted to uh, know how open you would be if that is something that has to be addressed uh, in the legislation, because I think the concept of uh, someone in law enforcement being on the commission has proven, uh, and fire department has proven not to be uh, as concerning from from the perspective of what we've seen so far that the mayor, when the mayor appointed, um, as people may have you know done. I don't know that they got brownies like Senator Wangard. Um, so you know I don't I don't know about that. But but the point is is that I believe that it prove that there are some expertise that's there. 
um, my other area is, um, do you see the conflict that individuals uh, see in one third of the individuals that would decide disciplinary matters being someone who also is in the same or, or was in um, the same brotherhood, they're retired. So are in the same brotherhood, I don't know. I, I feel like once you're there, you're there, so. Let me answer your, your first statement real quick. Um, mm -hmm. We pointed out and we've said to the commission or to the mayor's office or the executive director that certain people on that commission, uh, both in the, in the past and present, um, should not have been confirmed uh, because based on what they've either posted on Facebook or what they've said and things like that. So I think it, it can go both ways. Um, okay. I'm a very fair person, mm -hmm. at least I think so. Um, and uh, I am sure it's heck not trying to overrun anything and say, okay, you have to, you have to confirm this person because it's, there's no give and take on it. So, um, I, but I, I wanted to caution you, you know, that it works both ways too. Okay. Um, you know, even regular citizens don't necessarily, or, or are not necessarily the best ones that should be on the FPC commission. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as having one officer out of the three that's a you know, retired officer out of the three that's trying to determine um, an appeal, I think it's very important to have that. Um, are you overworking the person? Probably not. Um, and the reason being is, is more than likely those who retire stay retired and they want something to do. So I think having a person who is one of the three that steps on that uh, appeals um, subcommission or subcommittee um, offers the other two some points that maybe they didn't see during the hearing. So I, I don't think it's absolutely bad to have one officer repre representing the commission or one retired officer representing the commission sitting on an appeals board all the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dale. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have on my list here. Uh, we have Pat Mi Pat Mitchell, Ken Pelagi, and Aaron Chapman. Are you three going to come up at the same time? Yes. That'd be fine. Whichever order you guys want to go in. It's fine. Perfect. It's, it's turned into afternoon, so I will uh, wish you a good afternoon. Yeah, we're going to kind of try to keep it at about five minutes or so. so we, that will, we, could, we will be I think five we can get everybody in then if we do that, so that would be awesome. Correct. Um, first, uh, I want to identify myself. My name is Patrick Mitchell. I'm the current chief in the city of West Dallas, which is a Milwaukee County suburb, and I, or city of Milwaukee, rather. Uh, and I am the current president of the Wisconsin Chiefs of Police Association. I'm joined by some fellow members of the Wisconsin Chiefs and we'll provide very brief testimony on four of the seven bills that you're considering today. We are in favor of all seven of the bills, but we'll only speak on four. Um, so the first bill that we'll talk about is Senate Bill 120 which of course is the policy on the use of force reporting. Uh, we are strongly in favor of this bill. It will provide clarity for law enforcement officers throughout the state on what they should report, how they should report, and probably most importantly, it would codify current practices in many agencies in the state that they would be protected with whistleblower type protections if they see what they perceive to be wrongdoing and come forward with that allegation. That is something as a profession that we need, something that we want. Uh, so we are strongly in favor of Senate Bill 120. Um, I know that many of you sitting at the table today are uh, sponsors of the bill, the authors of the bill, and co-sponsors of the bill. So thank you, Senators Wangard, Senator Taylor, and Senator Jacques. Uh, and we know that there is bipartisan support on all of these bills. Um, and that there are good authors in the assembly as well. Um, one thing that I would be remiss if I did not say, so you understand use of force policies in the state of Wisconsin. 
the law enforcement profession that I entered in 1985 is drastically different today. Our profession did not start professionalizing with the tragic events that occurred in Minneapolis in 2020. Our profession, like any other profession, has been trying to self-improve for decades and decades and decades. So we do welcome police reform. Uh, that is why we are here today. Uh, but I want it to be clearly understood that as a profession, we have been taking steps to police ourselves and to better ourselves every step of the way for my entire time in this profession. The second bill that I will talk on today is Senate Bill 121, which is the prohibition on chokeholds. Um, again, as you heard the sheriff speak, uh, chokeholds are not trained in the state of Wisconsin, have not been trained for decades. Uh, since they are not trained, they are not something that we use. However, occasionally they can be used in a life and death situation. Uh, we are in favor of codifying in state law that they are to be banned. As long as the exception remains in defense of myself or in a life-threatening situation. Um, I believe Chief Pelegi will give you a quick story on the use of chokeholds. And then Ken, you might as well do your bill and then we'll finish with that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Senator Wangard. Thanks again, Senator Taylor, Senator Jock. I appreciate it. So, um, as we know, the, these bills all boil down to policing with our communities, not policing our communities, which are hat in hand with community oriented policing, all the things we need to do because we need a strong partnership with all of our community members. So at the end of the day, um, when we take a look at this, and as Chief Mitchell alluded to with uh, the, the chokehold, um, so I started in 84. Uh, Senator uh, Taylor very eloquently went through a, a lot of things regarding chokeholds and w w going back to arm bars, which is 82 or before, that were never trained. So an officer now with the defense and arrest tactics is trained when they show up at a scene, their, their presence is merely a, a, a show of authority. The uniform, the badge, everything we show up with. They are ta taught professional communication skills. I was taught by old cops a long time ago, you get a lot more bees with honey than you do vinegar. So you'd rather talk somebody into custody versus having to do anything hands-on where you go into the next level of empty hand controls under control alternatives to now, when, before I started, we didn't have OC spray or, or you know, uh, electronic control devices, i.e. tasers, which are control alternatives, where you go from the control alternatives to protective alternatives where you're under a sudden assault, where now it's on. Now we're going to our batons or worse yet, what, and, and God forbid having to go to a deadly force decision. And at any time compliance is we slide back down or de-escalate back down that scale. And I just want to share as a young cop, I can tell you about a young policeman that loved doing traffic enforcement. It was my thing. So I dug it in a small town. I'm not like Milwaukee. I work in a small town. I was the only cop on duty. So you're, you're the Lone Ranger, so to speak. And I stopped somebody for traffic violation on a motorcycle, and I thought, okay, just another one. Well, I walk up, and the cops schnoofer, uh-oh, I smell, uh-oh, he's been drinking. All right, not a good thing, right, when we're operating a motor vehicle. So the next thing I do is, of course, of an, an investigation on a motorcycle is we call for a backup unit because we don't do our field tests without another cop on the scene. Well, in the meantime, things got a little bit hinky, and I was standing with them, and I started seeing what we train our officers as pre-attack postures. We started, he started tensing up, the dude was built, and I thought, holy cow, it's gonna be on. I was like, just stay cool, dude, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. And he's, he's getting angrier and angrier with me, and all of a sudden, boom, I go over a motorcycle with him, the sudden assault is on. And my leg gets burned on the exhaust of the motorcycle, I still remember, I'm now screaming for help into the radio, I'm fighting for literally my life in a ditch of a, a roadway in a small village. And the one scary thing about cops is every single call you go to is a gun call you know why we carry guns into every single call so that means that our guns are on us and when you start feeling somebody tugging at your gun it scares the living daylights out of you and that is exactly what happened with me i was on the ground on my back in a losing position in the ditch in gravel and dirt fighting fighting and fighting and all of a sudden i felt the tugging on my gun 
And I had already been trained knowing that officers had had their guns taken off of them and been killed with their own weapons. At that point, it became what I, we call a dynamic application of force. It's justified, but it is not trained. And that justification at that point was I went into a grapple mode and I jumped on this guy and I put my, my arm around his neck and I started pulling back because I thought this guy's going to kill me. And as soon as he started to go down, it was like I was able to get him up, get him over, and get him into handcuffs, immediately de-escalating and then making sure he was okay when I got over. So the bottom line is this, is if, if, if nowadays, based on the legislation and some of the things that people want about saying, hey, in no circumstances can there be a chokehold, absolutely we don't train it and we shouldn't train it. But again, when a dynamic application of force needs to be where you're, you're fearing for your life and you're fighting for your life on the ground and you're not hearing those sirens coming yet with the cavalry coming to help you, that's why I really appreciate it. And, and Senator Taylor, you talked about and and or, as long as that is there so we can justify it. So that way, if something does go bad and this individual and, and ended up being arrested for multiple drunk drivings and the resisting and all the other stuff that goes along with it, but it's just something I wanted to share with you from a personal story. I've been on the job about 38 years, and, and that's, I, I, that's really the only time I had to do that. I've been in combat multiple times because, unfortunately, we are in a business of confrontation as law enforcement officers. It's what we do. We go into situations people call us to, and we try to bring peace back to them. That's why we are the peacemakers. But I just wanted to, to share that with you that... It was, it, was a, it was really a scary ordeal that I went through. And it's just something, just to bear in mind, personal story. So I just wanted to share that. And I appreciate you listening. I don't get into the war story thing, but it's just, you know, it's some of those experiences are good teachers. And then as a teacher myself, it's one of those things that you understand what a dynamic application of force truly is and when it is justified in very, very, very limited, narrow circumstances that you have to justify. So. Um, this is great. Um, I think these reform bills are great. Sheriff uh, Schmidt said a lot of them are codifying things. I think I commend Senator Zwangard, Senator Taylor for this, and Senator Jacques. I also really like um, 120, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 123. Is that the reporting of law enforcement use of forces? That I think is awesome. Uh, as Sheriff said, 2020, it'll be great to get that data and see what it really, what the, the application of forces look like. So with that, um, those were the ones I was just gonna testify, but I just wanted to share that story. So, so it gives a little bit more perspective just from a personal experience that I had as a, as a police officer. And like I say, I'd rather talk somebody in the cuffs any time of the day giving lawful orders versus having to do anything hands-on. And we try to train our officers to talk, talk, talk versus going hands-on. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. So we're going to let uh, Chief Chap talk first, and then we'll have questions. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Aaron Chapin. I'm the chief of police with the village of Shorewood Hills, which is the Madison Shorewood, not the Milwaukee Shorewood. Just oh, to clarify that. Oh, I didn't that. know there was a Madison <laughs> Shorewood. So we get confused <laughs> like, on a regular basis. I was like, oh, you're basis. from my area, and you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to thank uh, Chairman Wangard for holding uh, uh, this hearing, and also thank you, Senator Taylor, Senator Wangard, for your work on this legislation. All of these pieces of legislation, it's critically important as the other individuals who have testified uh, on behalf of the legislation. Um, I just want to speak briefly about Senate Bill 122, which is regarding uh, providing transparency and posting of use of force policies. Uh, this is, again, another critical step in being able to, to allow citizens, allow people in our communities to be able to see the uh, rules and regulations that officers are working under, what the expectation of the agency is. And one thing that I appreciate about this in this time that we are in today, this is not an incredibly heavy lift for any agency in our state to be able to put this out, to be able to have it on a website, have it accessible. Uh, and the majority of people, and I know not everybody has it, but almost everybody has access to the internet today, whether it's a smartphone in their pocket, a computer, um, they're able to access those policies, be able to have uh, a look at it, and then to be able to, to ask questions of their agencies uh, if there's something they don't understand or to bring a concern. My agency has uh, almost our entire policy manual published online at this point. I'm trying to get the rest of those out there. Um, but it's not an incredibly expensive lift or a heavy lift to be able to have that out there. So I think that this is an incredible piece of legislation that pushes more towards, uh, towards more transparency uh, and will help improve community and police relations. So thank you very much. And with that, the three of us are available for questions. Senator Jacques. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you all for talking to your mic. <coughs> I know it's hard to get used to. It really is. You know, I usually don't have people <laughs> telling me I'm not loud enough, Mr. I Chairman. Know. <clears throat> no, I, I just wanted to thank you for, for being here to testify, in particular for talking about uh, the need for the exception within the chokehold legislation, because I think that's something that I, I have so many friends in law enforcement that spoke to me and, and really um, outraged about uh, any number of situations where things have gone bad and the, you know this insinuation that chokeholds are somehow pervasive pervasive in the state of Wisconsin and that it's not a trained technique that you can't find it as as a trained technique and uh, and yet there needs to be that escape valve in an emergency situation that it is something that um, you know, you have a very difficult job. All, all of our law enforcement officers do in diffusing difficult situations, and the intent is always to uh, kind of find that lowest, most appropriate level that you can still get the job done. I remember when I first got involved with Crime Stoppers uh, and being friends with uh, my buddy Duke up in uh, in Green Bay, Duke Munger, who uh, who trained verbal judo, and uh, you know, just talking about you know again how do you how do you diffuse these situations but i can remember as we've legislatively gone through and i know the chairman has been involved with pepper spray and allowing for uh, that as an option for people to carry pepper spray and there were a few people that were opposed to even having that option but when the alternative is somebody carrying a, a weapon that is much more lethal carrying a firearm uh, you know in self defense why wouldn't you want to have something that is, you know, potentially, uh, you know, going to to cause less less permanent harm, be be less deadly, and uh, and that's what you're you're basically asking for is is the you know to to keep from having to lose your own life, but also uh, to keep from potentially having to, as I've heard from several law enforcement officers about the need for this specific exception, they don't want to have to think about using their own uh, weapon when they have another alternative available to them and, and this preserves that. So um, uh, just want to thank, I know that we've had a number of people speak to it and uh, appreciate the, the story though to, to really emphasize what so many of our, our officers on the front lines um, you know, have experienced. So thank you. And you hit it on the head, my fear if there is an outright ban on chokeholds Law enforcement officers have to find a way to get out of these deadly encounters. And if the state of Wisconsin says that a chokehold can never be a part of that equation, you're increasing the chances that the officer will use their firearm. Yeah. We would all agree that a firearm is much more likely to cause death than a chokehold. They both can cause death, but a firearm is much more likely. That is what allowing that exception to remain can accomplish. Thank you. Any other questions? I would just like to thank all three of you and the chiefs of police from around the state for the support and your investment in working with us with uh, all of the, these bills over the last several years. And um, I know that we're, we have a couple we're still tweaking a little bit. Uh, but we're going to continue to work on those ones we talked about. Uh, we're going to continue to work on those and get them to a point where we can get them on the floor and get this into uh, into law. Uh, Senator Jacques, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One that, that just kind of occurred to me, because while I am on uh, a number of the bills in, in this package, I believe uh, all of the bills that are uh, up before us today, with the exception of the, uh, the cop houses, the COP houses, and it's not because of opposition that I have to that particular proposal, but it is something where um, my communities aren't necessarily seeing the benefit from that proposal based on the uh, population limits that are, that are uh, or population floors that are placed in there. And I, I still, you know, I used to work for the city of Green Bay. I, I, I do see the, the value certainly in uh, having the, them as a, an option, but I guess uh, one thing that I would ask is um, for all of those communities, for all of your members, all the chiefs uh, statewide, um, what alternatives can we do in terms of investing, in terms of funding, in terms of 
uh, helping to establish those positive relationships in communities between law enforcement and the community, uh, separate from from a COP house. That um, you know, I know in the past we've looked at B patrol grants. In the past we've looked at uh, things for for SWAT teams or for uh, strategic search and rescue and and uh, different things that are all very important and have law enforcement functions. But I think if we're looking in terms of how do we establish um, community trust, I, I, I think the, the urban component is, is important, but I think we want to you know, potentially look at, at where can, we can invest outside of that. And I guess I, I just, I don't know if you have any thoughts for I where do. else we could be looking, particularly as we're entering the budget process. So uh, you mentioned one program that I would have mentioned, the BEAT program. Uh, the state already gives grant funding to certain local units of government for beat patrols, uh, foot patrols, if you will. Um, I could speak from my department. Uh, the more that we get officers out of the police cars and out onto foot, um, the easier it is to interact with citizens. Uh, let's face it, even if I'm driving slow on a squad car, if I'm doing 19 miles an hour down a city street, and I'm waving at people, I'm doing 19 miles an hour. There is no interaction other than a wave or a quick hello. Um, one thing that my city invests in is bicycle patrol. Um, that, in my mind, is a great way where the police officers can still cover a fair amount of territory, but they're easily accessible to citizens if they're on bikes. So I would say combined with the beat patrol that uh, bicycle patrol is a great way for some cities to engage. Clearly, if you're a, a rural sheriff's department, uh, not productive to ride your bicycle from farmhouse to farmhouse, but in cities, towns, villages, it probably is a good way to do it. going on is there something wrong and it's like why don't you get to know your cops instead of having a pain of glass between us so the chief mitchell's point with the bike stuff and the parking walks those would be great things even on uh, my community is only eight thousand people and it's been very positively received and that didn't cost a dime other than our policies if, if i could one one further comment sure one more um you know one thing that was instituted in the state budget a couple cycles back was something called the uh, crime prevention surcharge and it allowed for counties to uh, basically have a, a surcharge that was collected that then counties could invest in things that they saw as priorities locally and you had um, you know, county executives and mayors and uh, law enforcement you know the chiefs of police from the from the county had a representative district attorney public defender uh, the chief judge of the county and it's something that we have in Brown County. I think there's about a dozen counties, and I wish I would have thought about this while well, Sheriff Schmidt was still here because I know Dodge County is one as well. But it can fund everything from uh, treatment courts to uh, you know, at the shop with a cop or, or different, different things that uh, have that kind of interface, after school programs. Um, and you know, I, again, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I hope we look at something like that as a mechanism as opposed to state government necessarily telling local communities what their priorities need to be, but maybe something that we can, can partner with you on is finding a way to provide, provide funding in a way that, that local communities, county by county, city by city, can um, you know, find things that, that fit a certain criteria. And Crime Stopper programs can be included in that too. And, and, you know, but, uh, you know, we have a crime prevention model that, that works very well in Brown County. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think the extent that we can give additional options for you that know your communities better, you know, how, how we can right. address some of the, you know, particular things that are, uh, you know, driving vulnerabilities in, in crime in your communities. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're good. 
I have one question for you. If um, you were to give us um, a suggestion in regards to um, the disciplinary components, um, one third of individuals in, um, on the Fire and Police Commission, and I know it doesn't necessarily affect you, I, but I, I still would as leaders who have taken the time today. Um, could you please just share with me, um, one, do you see the conflict that, or concern that people would have? And if you see a benefit, if you have any suggestions on what might um, help to address that conflict that people might see. And if you don't have input, I respect that too. No, so um, I'm, I left the City of Milwaukee Police Department after a 27 year career there. Um, I do have experience with the internal affairs process. I ran that unit for the Milwaukee Police Department for about a year. Um, I do understand the apparent conflict of having a former officer sit on a discipline, but I believe Chairman Wangard uh, stated it best that you would ask that commissioner to recuse themselves from cases that they cannot ethically hear and the reality is they could ethically hear the overall majority of the cases. Um, so I don't fear that. I would trust the individual that's appointed to the Police and Fire Commission to much like a judge does in circuit court or an attorney does in private practice to recuse themselves if they have a conflict of interest. And merely knowing someone does not always constitute a conflict of interest, especially in a in a department like Racine with a few hundred police officers, you probably know all of them. Mm -hmm. In a city like Milwaukee with, well, they used to have 2,000 officers, chances are high that you don't know all of them. Uh, there's a much higher likelihood that you don't know them than that you do. Uh, but I think those situations can get worked through. And then lastly, on the chokehold component and imminent um, are some things that um, very candidly, uh, I believe would narrow the exception uh, even more. And I guess my question to you no, is, do you believe that uh, yeah. that yeah. type of narrowing um, could still be something that you could support? Yeah, so the use of the word imminent, in, in my mind, if a law enforcement officer is using a chokehold because of a life or death situation or in self-defense, imminent is in every single one of those situations. Um, for example, I can't choke someone because of what I think they might do two minutes from now, but I may be able to apply a chokehold for something that they are doing right now to me or to another. So imminent in my mind is already present so the addition of that word to the statute would clarify it, but you're clarifying a point that should be well known already. So imminent and and, meaning um, that uh, the, the threat in the, um, the, the um, that those things are both happening. You feel like it's, it's, it's obvious, so to say. Yes. Um, and putting in the statute, you don't see a challenge with that. Correct. Thank you so much. I appreciate your input. Thank you so much, all three of you. I appreciate you coming Thank down you. and spending the time. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Look forward to working with you. Okay, so we're going to have to go to a five-minute count time because the number of people that still want to testify. Uh, my chief of staff is going to kind of watch the clock for five. So you should be able to get that in. We'll try to keep it as close to five and try not to repeat stuff that's been said by others. But if you've got some, so please, we'd like, we'd like to hear that, please. So the next one up, oh, wait a minute, where is it? Yes. Just need my list here. Okay. And even if you don't see me, I can hear you. <laughs> you step right here to have a conversation with uh, Next up, Barb. Note, note sign is is that am, am I pronounced that right, Barb? Um, 
Yes, good afternoon. Thank um, you, Barbara. Can you Welcome. hear me? My name is Barbara Notestein. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, for coming to Milwaukee. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Milwaukee County. Um, speaking primarily in opposition to SB 117, um, because we're concerned that it doesn't reflect or doesn't enable citizens in many cases to be involved in the decisions of the um, commission as we think they should be. It was very good to hear you, Senator Wangard and Senator Taylor, talk about the fact that you're very interested in building trust, communication, and goodwill between police officers and citizens of Milwaukee. But there are portions of this bill that I think and the League thinks are really counterproductive to that. Um, I just want to say as an aside, the League of Women Voters is an organization that spends a good deal of time studying issues. We're almost like having a ledge council study. I used to be an assembly representative, so um, I'm a little bit familiar with that. So last year when there was a lot of um, vigorous, many vigorous de demonstrations, a lot of discussion about the nature of policing in Milwaukee, we decided that we needed to learn more about it. And in particular, we decided to focus on the Fire and Police Commission. So we have been listening to Common Council meetings, Common Council committee hearing meetings, Fire and Police Commission meetings, their subcommittee hearings, um, and looking at documents, um, audits of the commission, reports from the entity that is following up on the um, process for the city of Milwaukee to implement the agreement in the Collins uh, stop and frisk lawsuit settlement. So we've spent a lot of time looking at this and we'll have a report with some recommendations probably later in this year. But the concern that we have is that this bill doesn't in many ways make the Fire and Police Commission more responsive to community concerns or in fact work towards improving public safety, which is of course all of our goals. And some of the most objectionable parts of the bill pertain to the roles that the firefighters and police associations would play in appointing FPC commissioners. Now, I think you all know, because you've talked about it here this morning, or this afternoon now, that um, the mayor now has the authority to appoint uh, people who have been firefighters or um, police officers. But the bill would mandate that the mayor choose two from lists that those associations would provide. But if the mayor failed to do so, those unions would bypass the mayor and the council and appoint those two commissioners directly. There would be no public input, there would be no public oversight, there would be no hearings before the common council. Um, and these people would be appointed to run a commission that is extraordinarily powerful in Milwaukee in setting policy, um, writing standard operating procedures, and having input into a, what is a huge part of Milwaukee's budget. Ironically, um, and these are good parts of the bill, the bill calls for the Common Council to conduct public hearings, two hearings, when considering mayoral appointments to the Fire and Police Commission. But why aren't the association nominated candidates subject to the same public hearings when the mayor doesn't move forward with those nominations. We think the public should be involved at every step of the process. Furthermore, and I think there's been a little misunderstanding in the discussion here today, if I heard it correctly and I couldn't always hear real well, um, the association nominees would not be subject to the same residency requirements, uh, excuse me, would be subject to the same residency requirements that police and firefighter officers who work for the city are subject to. So that means that these people who sit on the Fire and Police Commission would be able to live up to 15 miles outside of the city. And I think and we think that people who are setting policy for our police and fire department should live within the city of Milwaukee. Um, one of the other things that I think the city of Milwaukee covered well was the requirement that the officers appointed serve on the panels that are reviewing uh, disciplinary actions and after watching all of these committee meetings and full meetings I can't see how that those commissioners would have time to serve on all those panels and I think you've discussed thoroughly the 
question about conflict of interest, and that is something that is of great concern to us. So to sum up, what we're really interested in, I will stop, is in promoting communication and trust between the police, firefighters, the Fire and Police Commission, and the city of Milwaukee, all of our residents. And I hope that if you're going to move forward with this bill that you'll look at some of these comments and find ways to honor the need and the responsibility for citizens to be more involved. Thank you so much. Thank you. You'd be, if you'd be kind Senator? enough to send, out, send us your comments, I would appreciate we it. We have it. Will do, Senator okay. Taylor. Yep. Thank you. We have, we, have, we have a written thing from, thank from Barb. Thank you, Barb. Uh, next up, we have I drank too much coffee, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Julie Grace. Is Julie here? Julie. And then on deck, we have Thomas Claussen. Is Thomas here? Yes. Oh, we're Thomas. Okay. You're on deck, Thomas. Well, Senator, Welcome, Julie. Yeah, thank you for having me, Senator Wongard and members of the committee. Um, I am a policy analyst at the Badger Institute. We're a think tank here in Milwaukee. And I am here to testify in support of three bills, Senate Bill 120, 122, and 123. We believe that these bills would increase transparency and accountability among police departments across the state, as well as improve trust among the citizens that they serve. So last year, we attempted to determine just how often use of force is used by police, police officers across the state, as well as how police departments discipline their officers when inappropriate use of force occurs. Our complete findings are available in a report that we released last year, but I will just share with you today a few takeaways from the research that we believe SB 120, 122, and 123 would at least partially address. We found that data on use of force incidents is really difficult to find due to a lack of both standards and legal requirements for the reporting. Without this information, it is nearly impossible to compare similar size police departments or those that handle similar levels of crime to determine which are, out which are outliers deserving more scrutiny. To get a sense of how often force is used, we looked at data from the state's three largest cities, Milwaukee, Madison, and Green Bay. In Milwaukee and Madison, we found that one of every 29 or 30 arrests includes some type of force. It was more difficult to compare use of force incidents in Green Bay because of how they report and track data. We also found that a majority of use of force incidents involved physical contact between police officers and citizens. And the most, the most common type of force reported was the use of bodily force, which accounted for 71% of incidents in Madison, 72 in Green Bay, and 72 in Milwaukee, so all pretty similar rates. But it is important to note that the vast majority of citizen encounters with the police do not result in arrest. For example, in Madison, in 2019, there were about 8,300 arrests out of 145,000 calls for service. But unfortunately, there's little information available on how smaller law enforcement agencies use of force and comprehend how law enforcement agencies use of force in no comprehensive standard statewide database. The bills that you're considering today, we believe, would take would take a step toward the uniform uh, reporting of statewide data. Although, as we found, use of force is rare, the compilation of uniform, publicly available, and statewide data would go a long way towards determining the trends, establishing effective practices, identifying problem areas, and just building trust among citizens and their police departments. In addition to gathering and reporting better data, we also recommend in the report, which I can give to you if, if you'd like some, we also recommend uh, requirements for creating greater transparency regarding police disciplinary actions, uh, extension of Act 10, uh, expedite removal of officers who have acted inappropriately, ending arbitration for disciplinary cases, extending probationary periods, and requiring uh, police officer employee files to be shared when they apply for positions in a new department, which I know you heard a bill on uh, recently. So the Badger Institute supports SB 120, 122, and 123. However, we also would recommend amending 123 to require departments to report on all use of force incidents and not just those where there was a shooting or a serious bodily harm. Thank you for hearing me today. Um, happy to answer questions or supply this report, which will probably answer them as well. 
thank you, first of all, for being here to testify. Yeah. I believe the Department of Justice does collect all use of force data. That's what I heard earlier from one of the police and officers. They've been doing it a long time, but now yet. it's it's got a different title now, though. They they switched the title. What is it? Amber, do you know what that is? The, what the? But this is our this is our attorney. One of them. These yeah, are the, my two. The DOJ is currently uh, collecting use of force data pursuant to a federal program um, called the Use of Force Data Collection. Right. And I believe they do have some specified types of incidents that qualify for whether the data has to be collected. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how broad or how narrow it is, but I know that the FBI collected it with uniform reporting. The, yeah, the UCR. And yeah. they changed that, that uniform reporting uh, requirement. And it's under a new title now because they're collecting more data. Okay. But I don't know if the data is going to be usable yet. You know, like it's right. just starting to where they're starting to, you know, collect it so they, they have a base for it. Yeah. So um, that might be something for you to. Yeah, to, to I was encouraged at. to hear a, an officer earlier today say that it is being collected. It just hasn't been re uh, released yet. So and I think um, that I think most departments, we look they to want that. to collect that information so that. Right. We know what's happening, too, on a statewide thing. So I think that's going to be very useful. Right. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Thank All you right. so much for, you. for being here today. Yeah. Thomas Klassen. And then on deck we have, is it Ty Ren Renfro? Is that, is that right, Ty? She's not here. She has to go to work. Okay, so we will, she's registered, so we will just register the way she was. Uh, ben Tuck. Ben, then you're on deck, Ben. Thank you. Welcome, Tomas. Yes. Uh, Senator Weingard and members of the committee, um, good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tomas Clausen. I'm an attorney and community engagement manager at the ACLU of Wisconsin. Uh, as you know, dramatic uh, incidents of fatal force against people of color have been captured on video, shining light on longstanding problems, most notably confrontational and racist bi uh, racially biased approach too many law enforcement officers um, uh, take to communities of color that they are entrusted to serve. Um, this crisis can be improved through the articulation and implementation of transforma transformative police practice reforms, um, embodying a bold, bold vision of humane, equitable, and constitutional policing in our society. Under this vision, police protect everyone's civil liberties and safety and operate as members of a transparent organization fully accountable to the communities they serve. We need to make some changes to accomplish this goal. Some of the bills presented today improve Wisconsin's statutory requirement regarding law enforcement agencies' use of force policies. Senate Bill 120, 122, and 123 are steps in the right direction, though it should not take a year to implement these reforms. We also need a statewide requirement for local uh, police agencies uh, that, that require de-escalation, place a high value on the lives and bodily integrity of community members, and provide clear limits on the use of force. We must support local police departments to enact good use of force policies and reinforce them through effective imp implementation, accountability, and training. We must also support values and principles that place a high value on the preservation of life uh, and the dignity of all of our community members. Unfortunately, Senate Bill 117 is a step in the wrong direction. The mandated changes to the composition of the Milwaukee Police and Fire Commission and the Madison PFC would be a huge step backward. The police union should not be able to appoint members to organization charged with police oversight, let alone have an automatic spot on a three-member panel that decides complaints and assesses discipline against police officers. Additionally, they should not have the authority to add a representative to the commission without common counsel or executive oversight, no matter the situation. Moreover, the proposed changes to the judicial review of FPC decisions give disciplined officers an unfettered second bite at the apple. A disciplined officer gets the opportunity to relitigate uh, the hearing before a court under a de, de novo standard, while the disciplinary authority cannot appeal a decision not to impose discipline. Also, the requirement that the commission's employees be nonpartisan appears to be unjustified and potentially unconstitutional intrusion on the public employee's right to political association. We are also opposed to Senate Bill 124, providing grants to cities for police houses. The communities that are currently targeted by police do not need more of their physical presence in their communities. 
This money could be better spent by investing in strategies that get at the root causes of low-level crime. We need to shift resources out of police departments and into communities of color, which have historically endured the greatest harms from underinvestment in non-putative resources and overinvestment in policing and other tools that funnel people into our criminal justice system. The world in law, law enforcement in the United States is extremely fragmented. As a result, overhauling, overhauling police practices in a meaningful, comprehensive way is a complex and challenging process. In Wisconsin alone, we have over 1,700 law enforcement agencies, and precisely for this reason, it is critical we enact meaningful change at the state level. You have this mandate both from your constituents and the moral imperative to do the right thing at this moment. Thank you so much for providing the opportunity for us to testify today, um, and I welcome any questions you have. Questions? Two things. Uh, one, Senator Taylor, go ahead. are you familiar with exactly what the uh, hub model of the cop houses are? Um, so uh, I, I'm just speaking to this specific bill and that specific portion. Of the bill. Yes, yes, that the the bill is um, for community oriented police housing, and I was just wondering if you were familiar with the community oriented police houses at all. If you, I, I was just asking if you were familiar with that. Yes, I'm familiar. You are. Yes. Okay, and and so you are familiar with the fact that it did reduce. Um, the uh, violence in the area that they were placed in the race scene in the Mount Pleasant area? Uh, so th those are different examples for different cities um, and not um, uh, directly correlated to what I'm testifying here um, about it being used specifically in, in Milwaukee and in places where communities, in communities, frankly, that I belong to, um, uh, do not feel that they need more physical presence um, of law enforcement officers in their community. Well, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on what the uh, community oriented police house was and making sure that you were aware uh, as someone who has been advocating for these uh, for some time. And it is really more of a hub model and a resource model and an interactive model. And um, for example, I'm not certain if you're familiar with the, with Izzy, the, um, city inspector uh, that was um, killed, or if you're familiar with the challenge that the ATU um, uh, union members have with busing and not having somewhere often to go to the restrooms or with inspectors doing you know, their work in the cars, or for that matter that people often go to the probation and parole office. And so the community oriented police house, it becomes a hub for not just um, police officers to be able to be a resource, it becomes a hub in the community for that interactive for all of those kinds of things. And so if you say that you know that model and you're aware of the uh, 60 to 70 percent reduction of crime that it uh, creates and that you are not supportive of it, I respect that. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that you had the clear facts on it and that I was clear on your um, your understanding. Thank you. Sure. This is also my organization's understanding <coughs> as well, so not just my own, but thank you. Completely understand. Thank you so much. It uh, appears I'm taking over for a minute. Um, <laughs> any further questions? I, I, I do have one myself. Um, now, due process is only going to apply to the accused, uh, not the accuser. Why, why would you have a problem with a de novo review for the one in not the other, other that's typically how it happens. Uh, so uh, essentially um, you get to, again, like I mentioned in, um, in, in my testimony, uh, essentially gets the, to provide the, the, the person who's disciplined an unfettered second uh, chance at litigating um, their claims, bring in, uh, and including the expansion of evidence. Um, and uh, we feel, you know, to ensure that there's still community oversight and that the, the discipline that does come out of PSC hearings um, holds some weight, um, that, uh, that just the, the review process a, as it is, um, uh, is is functioning properly. Um, and by adding the de novo review, similar to as the, the city attorney mentioned, um, also poses the risk of uh, essentially having to read, uh, redo in a complete hearing in, in state court uh, again. Mm -hmm. Um, and not I, I understand the, the what you're saying, fine. but that's that's almost kind of the point of the de novo is um, it's not uncommon to have things like that in 
restraining orders, family court, um, even even citations. If you're pulled over by the police, you don't like that, you can request a day and over in front of a circuit court judge um, for the specific reason that maybe uh, commissioner didn't have time to deal with the issue. Maybe the commission is biased um, and to give the de novo review. Uh, and on the flip side, de novo review might convince someone not to file a lawsuit because if a judge has already looked at it and kind of is the end of the road, maybe, maybe that pre actually prevents a clog in the system. Um, does your organization like think of it that way or is it or is it not thinking that way? Uh, I'm happy to circle back with you um, once I touch base with our other legal counsel and, and to speak more directly to your question, sure. um, if that's helpful. Any further questions? I, I can just say to you on the de novo piece that we've heard those responses and there's a amended version that we are looking at that does not encourage um, in art. And I think that's the message that you're suggesting that uh, de novo would just encourage people to disregard and just appeal uh, to disregard the Fire and Police Commission's view because they would just get an entirely uh, new kick at the cat versus someone reviewing what happened. And so we are not looking to um, gut the Fire and Police Commission's power um, or uh, what power, I don't even know if I want to use the word power, but you get what I'm saying. We're not looking to to gut that or to discourage people to appre to to follow that process and to usurp it. Uh, and so, uh, more than likely, that's something that we will um, be looking at, and I hope changing. But um, but I, but, I, but I don't know that no review process is not fair either. Sure, uh, I think some review process is fine and uh, I, I think you uplifted our concern probably in a, in a conciser and a more concrete way than, than I did in response to your question. So thank you, for, thank you for that, Senator Taylor, and thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, next up is uh, Ben Turk. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Turk. I want to thank everybody who came to testify here. I hope we all get a chance to speak. Um, Senate Bill 117 and 124 provide material and jurid juridical protections for the police who hurt people. Meanwhile, Senate Bill 120, 122, and 123 provide transparency and information to the people. Um, so taken together, these bills amount to giving us a greater ability to watch the cops get away with murder. Um, we get a little bit of information, they get $600,000, more appeals processes, and the ability to obstruct the work of the Fire and Police Commission. Um, that's not what we marched for this summer. That's not acceptable. On uh, Senate Bill 121, for chokeholds we know from Eric Gardner, from Michael Brown, from Dontre Hamilton, from countless others, that the police need only to say that they are scared and then they get immunity to kill. We've sat through two hours of cops talking this morning. Other times I've come to hearings of this committee, sit through hours of cops talking about how dangerous their jobs are. That's an indoctrination that police get. It's the same as warrior training. It is a morbid obsession with the supposed danger of being a police officer. In reality, this is not a dangerous job. Truck drivers die on the job much more often than cops do. Uh, nurses, uh, tree cutters, arborists, groundskeepers die on the job about as often as cops. So mowing the lawn is as dangerous as being a cop. That's the reality. But police are instead obsessed with their supposed danger that they face, and they use that obsession to justify killing three people per day in this country. That's terrorism. And if you look at who they target, that's white supremacist terrorism. The police are a white supremacist terror organization. And expanding their power through these bills and their ability to evade consequences for that, that's giving into terrorism. 
And we talked a lot today about the dysfunction of Fire and Police Commission and the politics involved in that. I've gone to the public hearings for the people, the former cops that Mayor Barrett proposed to be on the Fire and Police Commission. Problem is not just that they used to be cops and that maybe hypothetically they'll be biased in the hearings. The problem is that they were clueless about the concerns of the community when the community asked them questions in those hearings because they are the same as Senator Wangard and the other people on this committee. They're white people from the suburbs who don't understand what's going on in the city. And so taking that dysfunction to justify this bill, which makes that situation worse, is totally unacceptable. I mean, just look at who you're collaborating with here, Lena. Van Wangard. I'm State Senator Lena Taylor. When you're speaking to me in this committee, just for clarity. Okay. Okay? State Senator Lena Taylor, you are collaborating with State Senator Van Wangard, who represents a horseshoe-shaped gerrymandered district around the city of Racine. His authority has no actual legitimacy or root in democracy. And he is looking to impose the values of that white, rich, suburban rep people that he represents on our city. And that's unacceptable. And it's unacceptable for you to be complicit and collaborating with that white supremacy. This whole process mm -hmm. here is a joke. So, and I, and I, don't, I can't believe that Senator Wangard came and told us what the people of Milwaukee want. He doesn't have a fucking clue. It's a joke. So, and just like Senate Bill 119, where he wants to impose consequences on the city of Milwaukee, if we defund the police, if the people, if the Common Council listens to the demands of the people, the thousands of people who came out across this city and across this state, and he's gonna take away the Common Council's ability to meet those demands and defund the police, that's an imposition of a small minority of rich white people's values from the suburbs onto the city of Milwaukee. And it's unacceptable for you to collaborate with him. I'm very disappointed. That's all I gotta say. If I may? Question, sir? Yes, it's not a question, it's a statement. It's my job. I got paid and I got voted in to go to Madison and work with the other people that got elected. But they got elected. And with all due respect, you spoke. And it's my job to find whatever measures I can to move things forward. And granted, I respect that you live in a bubble of what you would like to have happen. You do. Of what you would like to have happen. I don't get to go to Madison and say, I create the legislation and it's just whatever I want. Because God knows if that was true, then when I chaired this committee, I wouldn't have had to fight with my Democratic colleagues to try to get some stuff done that I couldn't get done under a Democratic governor. So the truth of the matter is a legislative process of how a bill becomes a law is just real, like it or not. And so also the concept of suggesting that me doing my job and working with individuals to get things done, 90% of the bills that we do are bipartisan. And so it's not unusual. Third thing, I respect that you may not agree with every component of the bill. I don't, or bills, I don't. However, um, to suggest that that somehow or another is um, meaning that I, I, I didn't even write it, all of it down that you know, um, I'm clueless or whatever, or You're he's selling clueless, out the city. Or, or you brought in the map, the maps, the gerrymandered maps and all of that. You know, um, sir, I don't know you. You know, and if I do, I'm sorry, I can't tell through the mask right now, okay? So forgive me if I do. Um, but I'm a lawyer by profession. I was not only a public defender, but I worked in private practice. And I sacrificed a lot <laughs> to become an elected official who is in Madison. And I've championed these issues. And so you can feel how you feel about a bill or bills. I, I don't take that from you. But um, my integrity, my work, and what I do, because you disagree, sir, it does not make you right, and it surely does not make me wrong. The consequence of these bills is with, a loss for with, the city. With for all the due respect, sir, you are entitled to see through your lens. 
of your prescription lens that you see. And I see it through my lens. And because you've not sat in these seats and you've not done this work, I don't mean any disrespect to you, but you can disagree without um, uh, some of the things that you said, because I got some choice words for you too. But instead of me doing that, I'm just trying to share with you that I hear you. I even hear your passion about the things that you have talked about. I've even marched for the things that you And now you're selling to. out those people you marched with and that you spoke to. So with all you get on the so, market so, this so this isn't going to be productive, clearly. So what I'm going to say to you is that I heard you. But what I'm not what I don't accept is that your perspective of what it takes to do my job that that's correct. And so, you know, the only thing I can say to you is show me someone who has been able to at least get us a policy because there isn't one. Show me. Where is it? It's not. Show me someone who's been able to say the data should be um, reported and collected. And so with all due respect, sir, I, I respect the view that you have and that you would like things to just be that way. That's not how legislation gets done. It's just not. But and so what, legislation... I, what I won't do is be in, berated and insulted because you don't agree with me. And that's the only thing I wanted to say. I respect your opinion. And I hear you. It's the reason I, I do the work that I do for the passion and the things that you spoke about. But you also said some things that are not true about me and about my work. And for the nearly 20 years that I've done the work that I do and the sacrifices that I've made, I won't let you or anybody else who thinks that you're doing what you're doing to be useful to dismiss me and to dismiss my work. And that's all I'm saying. You, I don't disagree with some of the very things that you have concerns about in some of the bills. But what I won't do is allow what you did. And that's, that's my point to you. So thank you. We need to understand that the legislature is broken, it's not a democratic process, and you need to bypass it. And the Democrats, the, the, your party needs to bypass that process, and with the governorship, you have the ability to bypass these people. That's and, not and true. Grant, yeah, Governor Evers can Sorry. grant clemencies and release people from prison. We've been asking him to do that. We need you all, the rest of the people in the party, we need you specifically to join the call that he do that, that he pardon people and let them out of prison Sir. because that is something that these people can't block I'm and can't I'm pretty sure your five minutes it. is up. I don't mean no disrespect, but that's not true. And if the process was that, Have it Have you made a public different. statement calling for Governor Evers to release people from prison? Child, look it up. Have you? I've been doing it long before I even saw you fighting these causes. Thank you so much. Okay, next up. Thank you, Ben. Uh, next up we have Nate. Thorngale? Is that. What is it, Nate? Hi, my name is Nate Thorngate Ryan, and um, I'll go ahead and get right to the point about a couple bills here that I have a serious issue with. Uh, first, let's talk about Senate Bill 121, um, banning the use of chokeholds by law enforcement officers. Now, in my view, police chokeholds are modern-day lynchings and should be banned with no exceptions. Unfortunately, that means that I cannot support the bill as it's currently written. Um, let's talk about a couple of the loopholes that this bill allows. First of all, it allows the loophole of allowing restriction of blood flow to the brain, which is a form of lethal force that can be used by the police. Uh, second of all, it does not say anything about force applied to the back of the neck. I uh, recommend, you know, you all think of the case of George Floyd when you're writing this bill, um, and hopefully that kind of language can make it into future versions of this bill. And thirdly, um, the third police tactic that this permits is probably the most dangerous one, and that's lying. Um, just on any police report, um, on any police report, when you look at Did you say police, lying? Lying, I could, yes, okay, lying. Okay, I'm sorry. It's a little hard to hear, so come a little closer. I'm sorry. All right. Hopefully that's better. Um, Thank that's you. Better. Lying just to be clear for the record. Um, because in any case of police violence and police murder against civilians, what you will see on the police report is that the police say they felt threatened, their life was in danger. Now many times this is just done to save their skins and we see later that we see later on the body cam footage or other evidence that this just isn't the case. So um, hopefully, uh, I have hope that this bill can actually be revised and rewritten to remove these loopholes and ban chokeholds with no exceptions. Moving on, Senate Bill 117. Um, so we've got other people talk about the issues with allowing uh, 
the police unions to appoint members or, or to appoint their handpicked list of people to go on fire and police commissions. So that, um, obviously, I don't think I need to go over too much the problem with that. Right. But even if this was not in the bill, let's talk about the process of appointing these fire and police commissions themselves. We have appointed by the mayor and then accepted by the Common Council. Notice who gets left out of these proceedings altogether. It's the community, it's the people. These are positions that should be elected by the people. We need to look into alternative methods of, um, of police oversight to ensure true independence. Uh, you know, for example, like civilian police accountability councils are methods, are, um, measures that are being proposed in several cities. These are the methods we should be taking a look at to ensure true community control over the police, um, especially since, as we've seen with things like acceptance of the COPS grant in Milwaukee, we cannot always necessarily count on the mayor or the common council to approve what's best for the city. In fact, we can't even, even, we can't even count on these people to be democratically elected in the first place. And um, I know Senator Taylor might have some experience uh, running for mayor in an election where only five polling places were open in the entire city of Milwaukee. So again, more democracy democracy necessary, especially when it comes to police oversight. Uh, finally, moving on to Senate Bill 124, which establishes 6.6 uh, .6 million additional dollars in, um, in state funding for the police. So I'd like to begin my testimony against this bill with a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. exactly one year before his death. He said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. So I am here to fight against the process of the spiritual death of the state of Wisconsin. Now, I do characterize uh, the police departments as a military occupation of our communities, uh, particularly communities of color and especially black communities in Wisconsin. Uh, some evidence for this. First of all, uh, many of us here saw the people in the public, uh, in this public governmental hearing who came up uh, packing guns. You know, those were all police officers, you know. So we have the military coming into these um, the military coming into these hearings. Um, we have the military cooperation, the police military cooperation with government. You know, we've heard about the police unions helping to write some of these bills. And of course, we see uh, the chairperson of the committee, Senator Wangard, um, a longtime, longtime police officer, uh, lots of experience on, the, on police departments. Um, we also see police departments outfitted with surplus military gear, over $45 million worth in the state of Wisconsin spent on surplus military gear, okay? Um, we also see that police departments often constitute a foreign occupation force in these cities. We see in the city of Milwaukee, over 50% of the officers do not live in the city of Milwaukee, and that number only increases as you go to the other cities who would be affected by this grant. So $6.6 .6 million, I'm against this $6.6 .6 million, I would be against it if it was 6.6 .6 cents, okay? We don't need more police funding. If you want to talk about public safety, we can talk about the system of mass incarceration in this country that tears families apart and subjects people to cruel and unusual punishment. We in Milwaukee are in the incarceration capital of the world. We are the incarceration capital of America, which, by, which is the incarceration capital of the world. And we cannot allow these kinds of problems for public safety to continue. I've got a lot more to say about public safety. I've only got 30 seconds left, but I'm just, I'm impossibly angry that our state continues to spend more money on military programs of oppression against the poor and oppressed people who live in this state. Any questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, first of all, thank you. You got a lot in in your time period. Um, I heard you on the chokehold piece um, that you would like it to just be no exceptions whatsoever. Right now, there's no prohibition. Um, and the bill seeks to create a prohibition in statute. And, um, and I respect you prefer no exception. Um, trying to, you've heard, trying to do the and and the, the other pieces. Um, knowing that it's not as far as you would like, does that also mean that even that step and that progress, you just feel like it's, it, it's not useful? and thus don't, don't even put it in statute that it's prohibited? So I'm not gonna go on record as saying I'm not in favor of a chokehold ban, but what I will say is that I'm in favor of this bill being rewritten to remove these loopholes. I understand that there's a procedure, I understand there are amendments that can be put into this bill, that this bill has not been made law yet, so Thank I you. would be in favor of this bill if the language were changed to address the concerns that I talked about. Okay, and then the other thing that you mentioned, I think that you were talking about the 600,000 for the cop houses, right? 
As I understand it, it's $600,000 per municipality of 60,000 people or more. And um, 60,000 per 60,000 people. It's just 600. So it's 600,000 it's 600,000 that's in the pot and then that would be that would be divided, divided up by whatever those grants were that came in for uh, to ask for the grant. Then I would refer you to my comment where I said I'm against 6.6 .6 more cents going into the de uh, police department budgets okay. in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, and you are familiar with the cop house model, and you just don't like that model either. Um, I think that if a department, for example, like the Milwaukee Police Department, which has a current uh, budget of almost two, $300 million, if they believe that these sorts of programs are effective and efficient, um, then they can use some of their already massive budgets to implement these programs rather than asking for more money. Right. They didn't ask for it. Matter of fact, they don't even want to do the community oriented police housing at all. They haven't wanted to do it. I've been fighting with them for multiple years on getting a community oriented police house, period. Um, then, Senator Taylor, I would suggest that you continue that fight uh, without a bill that forces more money into police departments. <sighs> then I don't have a house. OK, but OK. okay. And then last thing um, on. Um, the 117, I mean, um, Fire and Police Commission one. Um, on the Fire and Police, and I, I hear you on the militarization of police. On the Fire and Police Commission um, uh, bill, is there any changes to that bill that would, that you, that you um, believe should happen within that bill? And are there some specific things that would like have to change for you to find any support in it? The section of the bill where it says that, the, the most important section of the bill for me, I believe there are several problems, but the most important section is a section that states how fire and police commissions are appointed. Again, this should be something that is done through de uh, direct democracy to give the people yeah, as, as strong of a voice as possible in these proceedings, rather than relying on mayors and common councils, which again, like I said, we cannot necessarily trust to do the will of the people or to do the things that are best for communities. And I hear you on that, and, and I'll end with this. The election process, I actually, and it's one of the reasons I, I, I kind of dialogued it with you, is because the election process is also concerning for me because often the entities that care about who gets elected, they then control those elections. So, um, I, so I would believe that the, that the uh, police union would then be extremely engaged in the election process of who is on the Fire and Police Commission. And the only model that I see that it's not exactly like it, but similar is the school board. And, um, and I, I've, I'm challenged with whether or not people who are economically um, challenged um, would be able to be engaged in those elections and thus um, end up on those you know, end up on the Fire and Police Commission. So I'm concerned that an elected process might get usurped by campaign dollars again, like it normally does for people of color, in particular in those that are economically challenged. So do you have some feedback on the elected process for the citizen review concept? Because our citizen review board, Fire and Police Commission, allegedly is a good model um, is what we've been told, but I'm cons I, I really have been torn with that elected part. So any feedback on that? So I guess what I would say to that is that the scope of this meeting is, I, I, I think, fairly narrow and reformist in nature. And I believe the sorts of changes that I would like to see in our society are only possible through a true revolutionary transformation of our society. Um, and that includes the way in which we conduct elections and the way in which we um, educate and uplift our most marginalized communities in order to be able to fully participate in democracy. I believe that our current quote unquote democracy does not do that in any way. I don't get to do all that just in this committee in this bill, but thank you so much. That's what we're here for. Uh, yeah. You say so. Okay. In my 17 years. Okay, next up is uh, Camila Ahmad. And we're at four minutes if we can get everybody in, so the timer is going to make adjustments. We only have the room for so long. Welcome. Hello. My name is Camila Ahmed. Ahmed, huh? I'm coming today, I'm standing before you all to speak out against SB 121. 
a couple weeks ago, I listened in to an FPC meeting or a common council meeting where a police representative spoke about chokeholds. She stated clearly and plainly that police were not trained to use chokeholds. The fact that there isn't a complete ban on chokeholds is concerning to me. We have heard on numerous occasions police officers use fearing for their life as an excuse for murder. As we grow as a community, I believe it is completely necessary for our police policy and procedures to be changed. There's no other field of work where someone can do something they are not trained to do, cause death, and still be employed. If a surgeon performs a surgery that they aren't trained to do and they cause death, would they still be employed? There's absolutely no reason why a police officer with proper training would need to choke someone until they die. This is the most inhumane police tactic there is. I would like to request that there be a complete ban on chokeholds with, that clear, with clearly stated language that says under no circumstances should a police officer be utilizing any type of chokehold. Furthermore, I would like to add that banning chokeholds is not a political issue. It is a human rights issue. Every person has a right to fair trial and not a death sentence. Every person at this table works for me. And as a member of this community, I feel unheard and ignored because politicians have made issues of life and death issues of politics. Protect our human rights and stop playing political games with our livelihoods. And I would also like to say, um, I feel like a lot of this is not taken as seriously, especially from people who are not members of the community of Milwaukee in particular. A lot of the bills and policies and different things that are being made are not coming from us. The things that we have asked for have been ignored continuously. People voted for you. People gave you your seat. And it is your responsibility to listen to all members of this community. Everyone. And as a taxpayer, I'm completely disappointed in the way all of this has been handled. Um, I also want to say, Lena Taylor, I appreciate the work that you have been doing. Um, but this is, this is really upsetting. It really is. Um, there's so many different ways that this could be handled. I'm not even sure of all of them. But I know that having this conversation about banning chokeholds shouldn't be a conversation. It should just be what it is. There's so many other places that have banned chokeholds and they have been able to continue their police work in a capacity that is still working for them. There's no reason why police should be allowed to do things that they're not trained to do. It makes absolutely no sense. So today I'm gonna ask if you could rewrite this bill to say that ch chokeholds are completely banned and that means all chokeholds, all of them, that would be a great service to this community in particular. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Camilla. And Camilla, you are heard. I, I respect that when we don't, when it's not the way we want that we feel that way, I get it. I get that completely. And I also get what the reality is of I don't get to say the way that a bill is going to be without the other 131 people. It, it, it's, that is the reality of how laws get made. And so I wish that I could tell you that we have a consensus, even in the assembly, and they've been meeting with the task force. There's no consensus, even on the task force, for a total prohibition. There's no consensus, even with the um, Department of Justice, where the AG is in my party, not in Wangard's party. There's no consensus even in that. And so 
and I respect, you know, the, the views and the, and the positions that people have. But then my position is, so since there's no consensus, do I want nothing? And see, that's where I differ from everybody else because I go to work to try to get something done. And so, no ma'am, it may not be where you want, but I look forward to the Camillas of the world that will sit in the seat that I'm in and move it from where it's, it gets moved to, to somewhere else. And do I wish that it was happened before I came? I sure do. But if nothing else, I wanna be able to say that it's not the same status quo that it was when I came. No matter how little it is, I want to move the I, I want to move the boulder. Am I able to respond? Actually, we're down to uh, four we're minutes. We're down to like three minutes per person. Per you can take all the time with me after this, and yeah, you if can you would. email me, and you can feel free to call me. I'm accessible. You know, and to the people who ask, what am I doing so next with up, Expo and with everybody Devin? else? Devin and uh, Anderson. Here he comes. So Devin, uh, you're and then uh, on deck <laughs> is Elsa Marks. We have Elsa. Okay, you're on. You're on deck, then, Elsa. Thank Welcome, you. Devin. Thank you. Um, can you can y'all hear me? Is this no. Me? Can you lift the mic up some toward you or something? Hello. Is this better? That's, That's better. a little better. Yeah. It might, it might have died, to be honest. Um, it's happened. We can no. hear you. All right. All right. I'll keep Turn my comments very close. You can. Um, yeah, I'm here to speak against the bill that would provide more funding for Cops House. Our position. My position is that we should not be providing any more funding for police in this moment. I think it's important that we name that like police in many ways are only the, the only fully funded departments in our city. Senator Taylor mentioned in Milwaukee that the police department's already more than the tax levy. So all the property taxes that the city collects is not enough to pay the police bill. And that's a problem. So we shouldn't be providing more. Um, you know, I, I'd never quote, I, I never have quoted, and I, I won't make it a habit, but even the former chief of police in Milwaukee, Morales, said police cannot and should not be the first um, responders to all social ills. I think Senator Wangard at a previous committee meeting last week highlighted, too, that police are tasked with doing too much. So in regards to cop houses, we're against it because we have to ask the question, why do police have to be in every function of our lives? Right? We have to ask the question, right, what do we want? I think we want to build safe and secure communities and neighborhoods where we don't need to have as much police interaction. So on the premise, we're not against community housing and community hubs and resource hubs. We're just saying why every time there's a potential talk about an investment, it's not always into policing. Senator Taylor, you know, one of the stories I tell a lot is, as an organizer, one of the things we do is go to library to library having community meetings. And every time I went to a library, no matter if it was as the library is opening in the morning or in the evening, in the morning there are already people lined up outside of it, right? Showing there's need and people want longer hours. In the evening, the librarian has to make the announcement, you know, we have two minutes and it's time to go. And every time it's, it's people leaving. So we have to ask our questions ourselves, why do we continue to invest in police and policing and not into other community functions and community hubs that will provide true safety for our people? Uh, thank you. I, I doubt people have questions. I know y'all run out, so I cut my remarks short. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have Elsa. Elsa Marks. And then on deck will be, it's a, is it Rebecca Burell? Burrell? Okay, you're on deck then. Welcome. Hello. Um, I'm not much of a public speaker, so I'm going to be reading off my list here. Um, my name's Elsa, and I'm here to um, actually speak in favor of a bill. Um, I really like Senate Bill 199. Um, I think it's really important that cops don't rape people, and I think it's cool that we have a bill that's coming that says uh, bill, like cops won't be able to rape people uh, without impunity any further. That's very important to me. I think there is no place for rape in our community. And if cops are doing it, then that's bad. Um, but my one question about this bill is I just want to know how often this happens that we think we need a bill to tell cops that they can't rape people. Um, that just seems important. Like, like it should just be like illegal for everybody. 
um, as was mentioned, if, if, uh, if a, a firefighter raped somebody, then they would just be arrested for rape. Um, which I guess leads me to some other thoughts on other bills, which um, like this oversight bill, um, the, there's a real push to get former uh, cops uh, overseeing other cops. Um, but if a significant number of cops rape people that we need to write a bill that says cops can't rape people, then I don't want those retired potentially rapist cops to be overseeing these currently working rapist cops. That seems bad. Um, I do like this bill though. I, I really like making it illegal for cops to rape people and I full-throatedly support it. Um, I do have issues with the language in the chokehold bill, however. The piece at the end that says, unless their lives are endangered, uh, that's pretty vague. And I think we've seen similar legislation in New York four years before the murder of Eric Garner. And Eric Garner's murderer was acquitted of the murder charge, uh, though he did lose his job because of language like this. Um, it would uh, be like, like in this example for the chokehold, I think it, it would be like if there was a bill that was being proposed to make uh, rape from cops illegal, if maybe at the end you put something that was like, unless their life was in danger. Um, chokeholds, like rape, have zero place in our community. And so this bill is at best an opportunity cost that puts something on the books without changing anything materially. Um, in conclusion, I absolutely support this necessary bill that would make it illegal for cops to rape people, which they do a lot. So thank you. Senator thank Jelly, you. did you want to speak to that or you want me to? You can, you can, I just want to say thank you. Okay. And about three times is the answer since I've been working on the bill that I know for sure that it's happened in Wisconsin. So the, so the way the law reads is, is that an officer can't have a sexual contact when they've taken somebody into custody. Sure. But if, if I'm the officer taking the person into custody, and I actually took that person into custody, but another officer, while they're involved with this person's in custody, whoops, well, I'm talking to this, and I'll fix it. How's that? Okay, so if another officer came in and they had the sexual contact, because they didn't take him into custody, that law wouldn't apply. Now this would apply, where we could go after them. That's why Senator Taylor brought this up. It was a loophole. So we want to make sure that anybody in any police custody is protected from it. It just, I think, speaks to a greater issue of qualified immunity in policing and the dangers in giving a special class of militarized people exceptions to laws that already exist for, like, me or a pizza delivery driver or something. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Elsa. Okay, next up we have uh, Re Rebecca. And then on deck is Omar Flores. Omar? You're on deck then, Omar. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for an opportunity to speak. Um, the fact that these bills have to be made means that you have acknowledged that there is a great disparity, a racial disparity within the black community. And for that, I will commend you. The issue is that these bills are made um, absent from a lot of the community members who have come up with real-time solutions on what it is that we want to see. And the reason why we don't have consensus in a lot of issues is because the people who are suffering and crying out about what's going on are on one side and the people who are not really affected are on the other side. So if we would take time to listen to the people who are affected by what's going on, then we will be able to come to a consensus on what would be the best solution to not just dance around the issue, but to actually make a greater impact. When it comes to SB 121 and considering chokeholds being banned, I believe that they should be banned with no exception. Um, what it does not include is the use of neck restraints that restrict blood flow to a person's head. I think that a model policy would say law enforcement officers should not use chokeholds, strangleholds, lateral vascular neck restraints, carotid restraints, chest compressions, or any other tactics that could restrict oxygen or blood flow to the neck or the head. What chokeholds are in my community are present day lynchings. In essence, in operation, they are parallel to asphyxiated restraints, which is the reason and the cause of death by way of chokehold. Officers are rarely alone. 
as in past lynchings. Usually they move, lynchings move in mobs. Officers move in units. And this is not a lesser use of force option. Um, and it's not the only thing, definitely, that's available. Self-defense goes without saying. Officers who are not trained on how to defend themselves with a butter knife, but in the moment of life or death use a butter knife, would be as permissible as what happened to George Floyd, Terry Williams, Seville Smith, Dontre Hamilton, Alvin Cole, Jay Anderson, Antonio Gonzalez, and Christopher Davis, just to name a few. The issue with the chokehold, chokeholds are not the few instances when officers may be in a life or death situation and be alone. The issue is the abuse of power and the egregious acts that we so often see in the black and brown communities and that the world has now seen live in real time with Mr. George Floyd. No exception examples can be seen in policies that are now in practice by Minnesota, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Missouri, Nevada, New York, and New Jersey, as well as Oregon. The next thing that I wanted to address is the COPS house grant, the SB 124, which I think is a horrible idea with the court, the culture that we have with the police, um, in what I can speak for Milwaukee because that's where I'm from. And I do know that what happened to the cop house, the Thelma or cop house in Racine is it got burned down post George Floyd. Regardless of whatever the tabloids or the media said happened, if a community burned burn something down because of injustice, it means that they were unheard. And this is not something that they accepted. I think it would also be a horrible idea for officers who have gotten away with murder, who have been under qualified immunity, to be in a community posted up with people who may not be after justice any longer, but now they have pursued revenge. So off, also for the officers, I don't think that that's a good idea, as well as the community inter interaction with police and the policing that we that is enforced upon us is what causes these police brutality situations thank you so just just one correction the the Thelma or house was our first house she was a activist uh, lady of color uh, in the civil rights movement she was just a phenomenal person and she worked very very diligently to to get the COP house program in operation and the individuals that torched that house were not from the community they were from outside the community and they didn't even realize what they were doing they thought they were doing something against the police when in fact they were doing something against the community in the neighborhood and it didn't didn't burn it to the ground but it was people from the outside that that came in and did that it wasn't the people from the community were just totally upset What's understood like? and being a it was a good thing the RCOP also have really been a good thing in Racine and being a grassroots community activist, I hear differently as well. I hear you. Well, I, I too just want to chime in, first of all, to say thank you uh, for coming to testify and sharing your input. And um, qualified immunity is something that there's some closer. separate work, hopefully trying to address uh, that issue on the cop house. I too was just going to chime in, um, not from the media, but from me walking in the community and talking to people and seeing the expansion of what they've done and talking to the original, he's passed away now, uh, chief that did the program and, and looking at the data of what it is. It, it, I know the name often, you know, because people think cop and house. Some people thought it was a house for them to live in and a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's community oriented policing is the whole concept of trying to create a different model of how police and the community interact. And in the midst of everything that you said, I think the only thing that I would ask uh, as you, you know, maybe uh, use Wisconsin.gov, my email, to uh, communicate, uh, and I left some sheets with my number and my email on it, um, to communicate, you know, I, I respect that the community police relationship is where it is. But just like in any relationship, Nothing will ever change if we don't start somewhere. And so I guess my question to you, because it's not going to go to the extreme of what people would like. There are some people who just would like there to be no police at all. That's not, it, it, that's not a reality of what's about to happen. And so 
we can talk about where we would, where somebody would like things to be or in where we are and the reality of where we are and how we get there in the process, not the process that we want to see government or you want to see government to be, but where we are. If you have some specific suggestions on uh, what you'd like to see, you know, it, it, you, can, you can name the extreme, but I'm actually asking for, um, uh, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. I'm asking for the bites. Well, one bite that I would take is first, I will vet the insurrectionists in the police department that have not been vetted out. Because if you talk about putting people who have been a part of an insurrection and not vetted out of a police department into a neighborhood of people who already don't trust them and they have shown why they shouldn't be trusted, I just don't think that that's a good idea. So before we even have a conversation about a bill about cop houses, I think that that should be a first step that we take that says, hey, we want you to trust us. So I hear you. And that's why I shared that my, my information of how to communicate with me is there because we won't be able to do what I'm talking about right here at you at the mic and me sitting here. And, and a perfect example of that, that what you've articulated and what can happen in a state legislative process and what can happen at the fire police commission and what can happen in the different places, that's all different. And so, you know, we can generically talk about what we don't like, or we can literally try to laser in on the pathways and the mechanisms to get to some change. And that is what I'm talking about. And that's, so I look that's forward under, to yes. that communication because that that you just spoke about is not something this committee, that, that, that's not even, it, it's, it, yeah. But I look forward to your communication if it comes. Definitely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebecca. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. You need me? I thought it was. Thank you, Senator. That's Senator Royce. She's on the phone. You probably can't hear her, but she's thanking everybody for being here. She has to go to another committee meeting, so that's why she's in another location. Uh, so she's leaving the hearing at this point. Thank you, Senator, for, for uh, being there today. Senator Royce is from the Madison area, for those that don't know. Okay, we're down to three minutes now per, per guest speaker. So uh, we have Omar on right now, and then Daniel, is it Hernan? Hernan, Hernan you're up on, on deck, Daniel. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, got yes, you, Omar. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to testify against uh, SB 117. Uh, when we look at the history of the FPC and, the, you know, in some places it's the PFC, uh, we've seen that there has not been justice for the communities that they say they intend to serve. Um, I've learned this through my work, um, you know, uh, working with families that have been victims of police crimes that have lost loved ones to police. Um, whenever it's a subject of the FPC, they feel sold out by the FPC and they don't feel like the FPC is, is doing the right thing. And so, um, you know, we, we have the endorsement from the Cole family for what I'm going to propose, which is CPAC, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but to put it short, um, what the police have been doing has not been working. And I think that when we talk a lot about like what well, we need a police officer, somebody approved by the union on the board, um, you know, that doesn't make sense, right? Because they're going to have a perspective that's going to be very rooted in the status quo and the way things have worked. And the only way that we're going to move forward is if we actually start listening to the community. So, um, you know, when we kind of like talk about bias, right, I heard some fears about bias if we let the community have too much control or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, well, you know, from people that were standing up here. Gotcha, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so when we talk about bias, I mean, we kind of have to think about that, right? Like if uh, you could be biased against police officers, why would that be? And you come up with like some crazy scenarios or whatever, right? But more than likely, it's because people had a bad experience with a police officer, right? I've never had a good experience with a police officer. And believe me, there's been times where I've really tried to get along. Um, so I've given up on that. Um, so how do we get people in that are not biased, right? This is sort of a discussion. Number one, we can't have police officers controlling boards that are supposed to control the cops. It just makes no sense. The first speaker that was up here was talking about, well, it just makes sense to have somebody that's an expert. Well, again, you know, an expert in the status quo, an expert in the way that, that you know, things have been. Uh, we need somebody that actually represents the community that actually wants to move forward. Number two, 
if these positions were elected, we wouldn't have to worry about whatever the mayor is trying to do. Um, and number three, we need the community to be able to negotiate with these police unions uh, because ultimately what they decide is gonna affect the community the most. And uh, we don't need any more overview. We don't need any more review. We don't need any more recommendations. We need actual control from the community to the police, right? And so when we talk about like, well, you know, what will improve the relation between the community and the police? And we've heard a lot from the community. It's not like they're just this abstract thing. Um, when we talk about uh, what's gonna improve that is improving the power dynamic, right? If the community has control over the police and they have full say over what's happening, then there wouldn't be any issues. And if the police are supposed to serve the people, then I don't see why the people shouldn't be in control of them. And uh, since uh, you know we're running out of time here, um, so I guess I'll, I'll just finish off with saying one thing. I was gonna speak against the other bills. I'm gonna finish off with saying that um, you know if the police are afraid of the community having control over them, then I don't know why they're serving the people. Is there uh, any questions? So, Omar, the bills that you didn't speak on, did you note them on your slip? I did, yeah, uh, 121 and, and 124. Okay, and, and whether you're for or against them? Uh, against. Okay. Yep. So you're against all of them? Uh, yeah, 121, 124, and then the one that I was just speaking on, 117. 117. Not all of them, though. Some of them, you know, like okay. the ones mentioned before, are pretty okay. good. But I'm also here to advocate okay. for CPAC, Community Control of the Police, and I'm just going to read off a few of these things quick. Um, so CPAC would allow okay, people to really hire. Quick. I'm sorry. I said Just really quick because we still got people at. Hire and fire the chief of police. Hire and fire members of the police board and maintain final authority over the police board and disciplinary measures, including firing of officers and convening grand juries. Control of the police department budget, a really big one. Uh, write and determine final authority uh, over MPD policy. Uh, oversee all investigations of police misconduct. Um, negotiate and approve all contracts with the police unions and then remap the city of Milwaukee police precincts as needed d as determined by CPAC. And to address the question that you had earlier, sort of about like, well, you know, the police unions have a lot of power, right? If this was a new elected position, this is something that we get really involved with, like we sort of seen with the FPC. Um, so CPAC would not allow for police officers to be on this board or anybody associated with police officers. Uh, this is something that's on its way to being passed in Chicago. Um, and the things that are preventing that from happening here in the state of Wisconsin are the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights and the current FPC legislation. So uh, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I, I'm with the Milwaukee Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. Uh, we're part of the, the national uh, organization, and, and so we're all fighting for this around the country, and we feel that this would create the substantial change that we need so badly in Milwaukee and uh, you know, around the state of Wisconsin. I just want you to know that I am familiar with uh, CPAC um, and I believe that the Fire and Police Commission model um, has a lot of pieces of what CPAC has. Mm -hmm. My issue with the elected component will require more time than I can give to you today. Um, and I, I have shared the model that brings me concern and would love to speak more with you about it. There are challenges for people of color to get elected even right. the school boards and so on and so forth. And the role that unions play in those settings would happen also with, with such. But There's a really good legislation in Chicago and Minneapolis I'm very specifically. Familiar. That, I'm yeah. very familiar with the legislation in Chicago. If you I'm could very, take and center some of that yeah. info. I'm very cause familiar. Because I don't want to cut the people off that are yeah, still. This right. is just, yeah, this is just so a you quick can, overview. So you can feel free to give Thanks us so that. Um, but I'm very familiar with it and spoke to the young lady who has worked with the Cole family. And Lauren tried Cross. to yep. very early on talk about it. But I don't want to cut okay. into everybody else's time so that there's some more. Daniel, we can uh, you're up. And then on deck we have Sean. Is it... Shevler? Sean? Schuler, you're on deck. All right. Hi, Daniel. Welcome. Hey. Um, my name's Daniel. It's, I wish I could say it's good to see you all again, but it's not. I don't want to be here. But I got to say what I, what I can and give you a little bit of perspective. A little closer to the mic. Gotcha. Um, I'm go. here you're with good. the Party for Socialism and Liberation, as well as the Unemployed Council of Milwaukee. So... First off, I just want to say um, I do want to support uh, CPAC as an alternative to uh, Bill SB 117. I think the fire, this bill 117 is, for the most part, toothless and does not involve enough um, enough of the community say in how we run our police. As far as I'm as well testifying against SB 121 and SB 124, police are not judged during an executioner. The abuse of force here is abhorrent. 
plain and simple, cops are state-sanctioned murderers. The cops, the cops said they don't train on chokeholds, so obviously the incompetence knows no bounds. Why, why are they using chokeholds if they're not trained on it? Um, excuse me, I had a, it, SB 121 has no teeth whatsoever, plain and simple. We need no chokeholds whatsoever on any circumstance. The police officer from West Dallas made a false dilemma, a logical fallacy. He said, well, it's chokeholds or it's guns. Which do you want? I prefer chokeholds. We can do neither. We don't have to use lethal force in every circumstance. It's just not <laughs> what we need to be trained on or training cops on, for example. For 124, we do not need any more money for the police. I said this last time and I'll say it again. Tear gas, LRADs, military equipments, tanks. The police are an occupying army and the people see it that way and we are afraid of them. Nearly 50% of Milwaukee's budget goes to the police. How much more bloated can we get? I'm currently, I didn't tell you this last uh, hearing a week ago, but I'm currently an EMT uh, student at METC. Uh, soon I'll be going out and actually protecting my community. And I want to let you know a little something from what my instructors taught me. Um, just a very important note that they wanted to make clear uh, from a retired fire, fire chief, as well as a paramedic of 30 years, told me, when I go into houses, take off the badge. People are afraid of the badge. People are afraid of police. That's what it is. People do not want more police in their communities. I just want to say again, the police are an occupying army, and we do not need any more money for them or any more militarization of the police. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Line up. No, I heard you. We're good. Thank you. And we, Thank you. We, we got the information. Uh, so next up we have Sean. Sean, you said? Yep. Sean? Is it? Okay. He's coming. Schuler? Schuler, okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Sean Schuler. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, yep. sir. Welcome, uh, Sean. I, uh, I'm not going to uh, necessarily say anything um, that hasn't already been mentioned, um, but I will say for um, SB 117, um, there seems to be a rhetoric that um, we need experts uh, in law enforcement that need to be involved with the commission. Um, but it's pretty clear that the only things that these experts want to uphold is uh, further protection of the police and, uh, and firemen. Um, there is no interest in the community when it comes to representation through these experts. Uh, we don't talk about how there is not community representation, but more police representation. Someone has to be a policeman because they're an expert. But all they're an expert in doing is being an occupying force, is killing in different ways, and not protecting or serving the community. Um, when I think of police, I do not think of a force that protects or serves. I think of people who control and, um, and hurt uh, per, uh, communities of color, uh, poor communities, they are not there to protect anyone. Um, that being said, um, I stand with Omar and Marper and everyone else who backs the uh, desire for CPAC. Um, I believe that if the community has control over the police, at least the communi community can say what the police should be doing and have control over what, who those police are. Um, the, uh, the need for a community-led accountability uh, council would vastly uh, improve, or, or rather, um, w would have the, I'm blanking, um, <laughs> would just be better for the community because the community members themselves are speaking, not the police. You do a good... Um, for SB 121, I would say that there have been numerous cops who have come up today and talked about how they were not trained in chokeholds. There is no training in chokeholds, but there seems to be an awful lot of death from chokeholds. Um, uh, for people getting arrested and taken down in chokeholds that they are not trained to do, how are they not, why are they not using what their training is? They're not even trained to do it, therefore they use it. Um, they do it to protect themselves. They do it because they fear for their lives. But why do they fear for their lives? They have weapons, they have training, um, they have backup. These people are not, they're protecting the community, they're there protecting themselves. 
Um, and I would say once more for SB 124 um, that we don't need more funding. We had gone through the entire last year talking about how we do not need to give cops more money. And I believe that the cop housing is invasive and unnecessary. What we need are community programs intended to actually help the community, um, resources, uh, jobs, you know, housing, food. We need things that will actually give the people what they want, not more cops. We don't need better cops. We need more resources for people to live. <sighs> Sorry, Thanks, that was a Sean. lot. Any questions, anybody? <clears throat> Any questions? Next no, Sean, up, heard you. Laura Biefeld. Laura Biefeld. And then on deck, we have uh, Frederick Phelps. Is Fred Frederick here? Okay. Who's after Fred? So, Frederick, you are on deck. And we have Laura Biefeld. Yes, Laura? Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm here today. To, can you hear me? Yes, yep. ma'am. Sure. <laughs> you can move the mic down if it down. makes you feel better. Good? That's yep. better. All right. <laughs> um, I'm here to speak out against Senate Bill 121 in regards to chokeholds. Um, we've all heard officers state here today that they are not trained in chokeholds and that they do not use them. If this is the case, why are, you, why are we fighting so hard? to keep a method of strangulation officers, by their own words, do not use. I'm asking you, how have so many officers continued to inflict trauma on the communities they serve? The exact wording in this bill, except in life-threatening situations or in self-defense. The golden ticket for law enforcement has always been, I feared for my life. Why is there no acknowledgement of the fact that the people fear for their lives? Not because we have chosen to put on a uniform, but because we were blessed with melanin. How are you arguing in defense of the lynching of your community members? Not only should chokeholds be banned, but we should be talking about the use of force while officers have suspects in prone positions, applying pressure to any area of the back. The pressure applied in these situations also slowly and painfully stops the flow of air to the lungs and blood to the brain. Note I said slowly, it takes time to suffocate someone. If law, law enforcement officers are unable to course correct and make a decision to not take a life in that time, they should be looking into a new career. There are ways to take someone down perceived to be a threat without injury to all involved. If chokeholds are being used as a last res resort when an officer is panicked, they are not only causing harm to the victim, but to the officers involved. The level of stress is known to cause death from cardiac arrest after the restraint. I thank you, I'm finishing up. Why are we not training in methods of restraint with significantly less likelihood of causing harm to all involved? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Frederick Phelps. Fred. And then we have Hayden Harwood on deck. Hayden? Stay left. Hayden left? Yeah. Okay, so we'll register Hayden. And how about Caesar Ramos? Caesar, then you're on deck. Ramos. Ramos. Gotcha. Senators, good afternoon. My name is Frederick Phelps, and I'm a student here at EWM. Thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, I'd like to speak in reaction to some of the others who have exposited some radical fringe views. Uh, please consider my thoughts, which I assess to be representative of the majority view, even here on a campus such as this. Naturally, I support any measure that directs government force in a limited and appropriate way. The government represents the people. Restraint is always essential. In contrast, others have proposed keeping the police out of endangered neighborhoods. This isn't restraint. This is surrender. Polls clearly show that the majority of residents in crime-ridden neighborhoods want and need police presence. In my charity work around the city, I hear these views echoed all the time. I suggest that the abolitionists present listen more to the people and less so to radical pamphleteers. Others have slandered the police, calling them murderers. This is unacceptable. 
I will condemn any police officer who is guilty. I'll say again, I will condemn any police officer who is guilty. I will not have the remaining honorable portion of the force who serve the community be abused in this way. I suspect many of the more unhinged speakers will be well served by more life experience. I had the privilege to serve overseas in the military. There, I saw the alternatives. I watched police act with impunity as they brutalized protesters. On the other hand, I saw the, alter the opposite of that, where a weak and chaotic police force allowed corruption and crime everywhere. Let us be grateful for our own blessed situation. Justice is a great concern. Let's pursue it rationally. Some have decried that the police are the only armed ones, representing a military-style force throughout the communities, and occupying power even. To those I say, make sure you can legally arm yourselves. It is still your right. Banning chokeholds outright sounds laudable, especially after the outrageous death of George Floyd. However, it would only lead to more fatalities. If unarmed restraint is prohibited, then other more lethal options will be all that is left on the table. That is the inevitable conclusion. The bill's limits are reasonable and sufficient. Senators, thank you for taking efforts to make sure justice and safety are served. While you consider these measures, please remember the voice of the people. The majority support your moderate and reasonable measures. Thank you for your time. Thank you for Thank you. sticking around. I Appreciate it. Uh, we have a question for you. Question. Which uh, which branch were you in? I was Senator in the Army, Senator. Weber. I was uh, I was a Marine captain, uh, and uh, I know the feeling of having put yourself out there uh, only to have to respect the fact that people are trying to tear down the thing that we uh, tried to protect. Um, and that we offered ourselves up to protect the things, uh, even the speech um, uh, advocating for tearing down this place. Um, so I think what you have to say is um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty spot on. In my law practice, I was a judge advocate. Um, uh, I came back here and I would litigate these types of claims uh, with the police department. Some of the things that are being requested are not unfounded, uh, and there can be some some things, but um, uh, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to point out to you that uh, it takes a lot of courage to have to be interrupted when nobody was interrupting anyone else, even though all of us up here who have been to school have been hearing these arguments for 20 or 30 years, and we know them. Um, so we are open to understanding and hearing these things, especially veterans who went out there and put themselves out for these people to have the ability to speak them. So I respect what you've done today and uh, had the courage to come up here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And just briefly on that comment, uh, I have seen where weapons were the only opportunity uh, to respond to situations and more training, which requires more funding, is obviously the solution to that that applies in the military and in uh, police context. So I'm happy to see any appropriate funding for training. Thank you. I too wanted to just take a moment to um, thank you for saying and sharing and um, as somebody who um, makes sure to always speak my mind. Um, I believe in you having the ability to speak yours as well as other people in the room having the ability to speak theirs. Um, my pushback on everybody, the same way that I said to the other person who chose to do it with me, is to not do the name calling of others, is I think the first thing that I would want to say in the midst of what you've articulated because there's legitimacy um, in the concerns that have been articulated, I believe, too. But I, I truly. Your conference is ending now. Please hang up. All righty then. Uh, but I truly do uh, appreciate you staying around and providing input. You said you go to UWM, and I'm sorry, do you also live in Milwaukee? I do, area? yes, Senator. Okay, is it my district or somebody else's? Uh, no, not, not okay. your Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, appropriate responses, I thought, throughout, even when uh, people held stronger opinions. So thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Okay, next up we have Caesar. I think we're going to have to hang up the phone over there. It's calling itself or something. He'll do, we're actually over our time in here, so 
We're going to keep you to three minutes, okay, Caesar? Just like that? Yep. Gotcha. All right, so we've heard a lot of dog whistle terms to, to criminalize our neighborhoods as crime-written areas. I would ask, have you ever lived in those neighborhoods? Have you actually lived there? I lived in the 53204 area for speak, 20 years. Speak to the committee. Speak to the committee. 53204, I lived in that neighborhood for 20 years. And, I, I, and I, it makes me angry, and you can tell that when people use dog whistle terms, crime-written areas, that's what you think of my community? A mostly Hispanic, mostly immigrant community? That's what you think of us? Think before you speak. Every word that you use matters. That goes to everyone on the board and everyone here today. I'm here to speak up against SB 124. The police does not need any more money for its criminal activities and its militarization. I was there in Kenosha as uh, I saw them use tanks as they drove up into t in, in the parks. They used flashbangs. They used chemical agents against pe peaceful protesters that were chanting Black Lives Matter because somebody got shot in the back seven times and people seem to forget that. Where's the police safety there? Where's the police safety when Kyle Rittenhouse shot two people in the street, murdered them, and shot a third one? He walked past the cops and got home safely. I saw him. I was there that night. I had to flee for my life with my rest of my friends. Where were the cops? Where's the safety there? You guys want to give them more money, reward them for their behavior? This is not the way to do it. We need CPEC. We need community control of the police, and we need it now. Any questions? I have two. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the cop house model that's in Mount Vernon? Uh, no. Superficially. I know it's more money for the police, and that's not what we need. It, I just want to say to everybody, it helps to create resources for work, it criminalizes our communities by having more police on the ground. I have seen Clearly more cops in my clear. neighborhood in the past two months that I have before Sir. the pandemic started. And more, more police in our communities is not what we need. They just criminalize our community members who need assistance, who need services, who need resources. We Sir. do not need police, guns, or violence in our neighborhoods. And so I heard you. And I'm trying to correct your thought of cop houses, and I respect that I can't. I'm letting you know that they provide resources. I'm letting you know that it allows for the very types of things that you're saying. And I personally believe that when there is community and police relationship and they're working together and police are helping individuals other than the circumstances that they normally are in, this is a different type of hub process. And that I would argue that the police I, have enough, more just, than enough funding. If I could just finish my point, but I, 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 I hear you. And I've already said what I have to say about CPAC, that the elected uh, portion of that, I don't believe has been thought through effectively and how, what that ends up doing for the very communities that you yeah. spoke to. Milwaukee has more, uh, what, 42% or more of the city's budget that's more than enough money to do whatever they need to. If they really need to, they can move some money around. That's what I have to say to them. Well, I don't we don't need more money for the cops. No more money for the cops who are shooting us in our neighbor in the neighborhoods. Michael Mattioli strangled Joel Acevedo as right, but, two people held not, him down. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm the police cop violence. House. We're not here to talk okay, about police I don't accountability. Argue with you, and I respect you. Want to make a scene. And, and that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have a real conversation with you about what it is, but I'm gonna let other people speak. Thank you so much for your time. My number's back there if you want it. All right. Thank you, Caesar. With that, that is our last speaker. I wanna thank everybody who stuck it out and stayed with us and stayed here to testify and all of our members who I traveled to, yeah. to, to I wanna thank members too that came down and came down to Milwaukee. I'm born and raised in Milwaukee. I live on the block that I've been on for 54 years. I've watched that community change. I thank you for coming and hearing. Uh, I hope it also gives you a sense of what it, what it means for me to be on the bills based on 
everything that you have heard. And, um, and I hope that you know that the CPAC concept that people are speaking about, that you got the flyer about, that is the desire um, to a large extent of what the Fire and Police Commission, how it should kind of function. The problem is, is it hasn't quite functioned that way. And my biggest challenge uh, with the elected part that they speak to is just how lopsided that potentially could become and controlled, um, but, but clearly um, a citizen controlled review concept is what this is supposed to be. So thank you for uh, hearing and I look forward to the work that we will continue to do on these bills. Page staff, YouTube guys, UWM, thank yes. you so much. Yes. Give yourself Excellent a hand. Job. To the media that stuck it out with us, thank you too. Who gets the gavel? I'm taking it off the gavel. It's great to have my attorneys here. They didn't even have to.